Francis, could you just say something without I just, being so? I just want God. God. Could you go, 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 But this okay. isn't about hype or emotionalism. Uh, no, no. You can't be up here because we were the ones that thought of it. <laughs> People are there to see you, and you're scolding them for going to a thing to, to see, see you. you. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Hit, Hit the, the bar. bar. I'm Steve Kozar. I'm Paulette Kozar. And we've got... Pebbles and Ginger. Pebbles and Ginger. So they've been... For the moment. Until they decide they don't want to be up here Oh, anymore. yeah. I've got our friends from... Minji. Sent us treats. Um, we ate ours already, but I'm giving <laughs> these to the dogs because it's theirs. And so this is their reward for staying here with us right now. Now this is Pebbles, uh, Pebbles' turn. So um, we've had him for about four weeks and um, found out that um, this one here has got heartworm. So she tested negative in January, but... Um, mm. That cold water, it's delicious. It's lifting. It's lifting. It's lifting. But anyway, uh, Pebbles is fine. Ginger probably is in the early stage. They, they took some more tests. And basically, we're going to start with um, a procedure for her in this next week. Um, not something so evasive because of her age. But we're pretty optimistic. If yeah. you guys could be praying for her and us, that'd be great. We have a particularly difficult video to cover oh, tonight. Oh, my goodness. You know what, guys? If you don't have treats, I'm going to try to hold off. Hey. Because I'm the Galatians girl. Behind you there? Yes, behind me. Uh-oh. Is there that? Yeah, keep, just keep it there for now. Because yeah, whenever, whenever they hear a plastic bag rattling, they think it's for them, and then they get neurotic. Oh, they do not. I also want to say thank you so much to Graham. We just got this today from Manuka Brothers Coffee in New Zealand. Wonderful. Fire roasted coffee beans. We already had some coffee a couple hours ago, and it's yeah. all gone. Otherwise, I'd be sipping it right now. Yes, thank, thank you. you. We just but got it today. You know what we might want to do periodically? I just sniff it. Just take a, <laughs> just to keep awake. Oh and, yeah. And kind of Ooh. calm. Okay. And like life is worth living as we're going through this. Let's just get the. Can you guys smell that at home? Okay, so. Anyway. In case you haven't watched our goofy show before, I'm Steve Kozar. I've been an artist all my life, and I started looking into theology and bad preaching and stuff about ten years ago, and turned into a blog and then a YouTube channel. And so for the past little over a year now, we've been going through videos ourselves. I got my wife roped into it. Sure does. And I had to bring the dog eventually, our, our first dog down here, because she would be scratching at the door. Yeah, we're, we're in, in the basement. In the basement. And then when she died... Um, we got these two. Yeah, we adapted these two. They've been together for 10 years, and they are so much fun. They're a hoot. They really are. We're very thankful. So what are we going to be talking about tonight, honey? Francis Chan. You guys! You guys! I mean, seriously! <laughs> I'm sorry. We might be a little over the top today because we've seen this several times already. Oh, yeah. But at least we know what we're looking at, and yeah. we know where to go in the scripture to be more on top of things. So that's helpful. But before we do that, I yeah. want to give a shout-out to all of our campuses all over the world. Hey, we're going to be talking about the Sen, which is a giant movement of campuses. <laughs> there are people who are supposed to be in college or just got out of college or something, but hey, we love you. We're so glad and excited and Everything stuff's else. happening and wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They, well, they, didn't, they didn't seem to be bothered by that too much. They're used to our Craziness. shenanigans. Yeah, shenanigans. This so, one this one snarls like um like Elvis Presley. Yeah. It's not Her a lip snarl. Goes up. I can't tell what it is. Her lip goes up. <laughs> and then she doesn't really cry. She talks. Yeah. And then this one doesn't do that. She goes <laughs> her whole body goes, <laughs> but she doesn't know how to howl or anything, but we're working on it. Anyway, so it, we haven't been out for a while, you know, up on air to do this. Um, so it's nice to get back in the seat, in yeah. the saddle. We're back in the swing of things. Yeah. So this happened in May, uh, roughly three weeks ago. Right. This is not from the Send event. If you don't know what the Send is, it's a uh, it's like five, six, seven different organizations all working together to put on this one day giant stadium event. This was in... Uh, to reach the young people so they can go and be missionaries. Yeah, Arrowhead Stadium. Hence the send. We're, We're going to send. send them. Well, it was called the call. And then they said the call's done. We've called enough people. Now we got to send them. 
but it's, a, it's essentially the same exact thing. You yeah. get a bunch of people into a room, I mean a stadium. A stadium. And you have tons of music blaring and you work them into a hypnotic state mm -hmm. where they're open to the power of suggestion and then you have people largely yelling all day about how you got to do more, try harder. Jesus is waiting for you to go out there and change the world. He wants to change the world. He wants to do all sorts Just of stuff. for you. But he can't do it until you young people get out there. I'm obviously oversimplifying and yeah. being kind of snarky. But um, we've seen this stuff for decades now. Yeah, we have. And the senior leaders in these groups have also seen this and have made tremendous claims about what was right around the corner for decades. Decades. And we've even seen our own, some of our own kids and their friends yes. go to events like this, go to organizations They're like the young ones. The They're International House of Prayer. Everything. Yes, and, I hop. And then turn around and become an atheist a year right. later. Right. This is happening in uh, tremendous quantities. Amounts, or, yeah. So I think there's a lot of complexity to this, and yeah. I don't know how far we're going to go in being able to analyze it and explain it, but we are going to use this Thursday night warm-up session. He keeps saying tomorrow, but this is actually Thursday, so he flies around a lot. He doesn't know what's going on. He He'll just, even tell us that. Yeah, he. So, but he's, he's getting everybody, he's trying to give them some teaching before the send event where they're going to be told more stuff to think about. And I found this to be uh, really quite bad. Yeah, it's and, bad. And what's amazing is that in this environment, Francis Chan is considered a very serious, mature Bible teacher. And he's not. He doesn't, he doesn't really know largely. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and I, I think you're going to see that. And I really want you to stick with this. Yeah. If you're frustrated by us interrupting, which is what we do when we, we hit, hit the, the space bar. bar. Space bar right? I'm going to put a link to the actual video. Now, it's a two-hour video, but his talking part is the middle section. It's about 45 minutes 45 or so. 45 minutes or mm -hmm. 43 minutes. Uh, just to give you a quick idea, this is not the big stadium event. I believe this was at a tent uh, on the grounds of IHOP. Okay. They actually had to send at Arrowhead Stadium, but... I, I'm... Okay, so now I'm going to be an old person. Okay, well, I, we are old. Yeah, I used to be a young person. I used we to did. do young person we things. We used to be young. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you for that. So what happens when you get you older. You did that all off the top of your head. I did. That's why oh. you have me. I'm the, I'm the brains. Yeah. You're oh, the brawn. Okay. <laughs> in the late 70s, uh, we were both involved in some youth group stuff. You know, we were going to go out there and... Change you know, the world. The church was old and outdated. And, you know, we needed popular music. We needed to try to be more like popular culture so that we mm -hmm. could influence the world and, you know, get more people saved and grow the church and stuff like that. This is not really a new idea. It's been going on for a long time. But one thing that I find really peculiar is that every one of these events, okay. it has become absolutely normal for these people to be on stage doing their thing, worshiping God. Yeah. This is all about God. It's all about God. It's all about God. And there's always, always, always a team of people constantly swarming around with cameras. Yeah. I mean, they're on the stage it's with them. It's weird. It's weird. It's like, wh what does that do? Why, why, why do you what have to have do? pictures of everything? And, and this is not even the send. And at the send, I think, is actually worse with even more people with more cameras. Black men and women raise up in courage with a fire in their eyes saying my life is for the king! Okay, so we've already got some yelling and screaming. It's 24 minutes into this uh, Thursday Text night. Yeah. yeah. This isn't the real event where they're really getting them worked up. Yeah. It's a precursor. Yeah. There's some other people that talk, and then this guy gives a really cringy introduction to Francis Chan. And lean in and pull on Francis. Can we welcome Lean Francis in and Chan? pull on Francis. That'd be painful. <laughs> lean in and pull on him. Okay. By the way, um, this screen is all washed out. Yeah. And I actually put it in iMovie so that I could bring up the brightness because it's so dark you actually can't see most okay. of what he's doing so this isn't good video quality it's not my screen it's not my camera it's the original video was in this very dark okay thing and i think it should be loud enough also i play everything through this video camera and through my speakers because i don't use any original source video because uh, some of these organizations they have a, a really bad habit 
a bad practice of giving copyright strikes where nobody's actually violating anybody anybody else's copyright. I haven't mentioned this for a while, but yeah, uh, big Christian organizations, mm -hmm. instead of answering the critiques of people on YouTube and trying to explain why they Their say why, why they say mm -hmm. the things they say and where where is the biblical you know uh, backing, mm -hmm. they just say to YouTube that video is violating our copyright and YouTube does not have the manpower to check into it and to do a quick look into the claim they just automatically will remove yeah. the video and so these large organizations give a a, um, a strike a, a fair use claim which is actually <coughs> illegal it's literally an illegal practice to claim that somebody is violating your copyright when they aren't so anytime you put up a video and you talk about that video and you critique it, even if you just make fun of it, and if you do satire, that's all permitted under U.S. law and it's the fair use law. But I just thought I'd clarify that. Good. Um, and uh, while I'm mentioning that, some people say, did you go to Francis Chan in person? No, I did not. This is a public video on a public forum, so I'm publicly commenting. And this is not an issue of personally being offended by, by Francis Chan. Right. I, I don't know the man. He hasn't personally offended me. He's teaching doctrine. And he's doing it in a public forum to literally millions of people. And so we as Christians have the right to critique that mm -hmm. and to question whether or not he's actually teaching things that are truly biblical. Right. Matthew 18 pertains to when a brother sins against you personally within your congregation. Right. Instead of complaining about him behind his back, you go directly to him and you say, hey, you know, the other day, I think you stole my coffee beans. Right. I found them <laughs> at your house. And then he can say, no, no, you gave them to me. Don't you Don't remember? Don't you remember? And then you go, oh, I'm sorry. So you solve the problem personally if you yeah. can. But if somebody does something that's in the church, then you go to the other people at church and they try to bring in some objective outsiders to resolve and the problem. And this is all the local church. It's all within the body of church when people are personally offended Involved. with each other. Mm -hmm. You can actually critique doctrine all day long, especially a public speaker who's famous. The, the New Testament makes it really clear that a New Testament pastor type and anybody who's doing what Francis Chan does fits the role well enough that he should be held more accountable than just a regular member of, of uh, the Christian church. Jesus. Oh God, please move in our midst tonight, God. Please change us. Be, make this of your Holy Spirit, not of hype, not of emotion, but of you. Say, so he's already <laughs> made the most glaring error, and he continues to make Sorry, this error the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know his intentions. I really don't. Right. I don't know what's going on in this guy's head. I've, I've studied him for a while, and he really frustrates me. Because... We should have Dr. Grande yeah, take I a know, look at him. Yeah, I know. Um, he, he says something like he just said, but he is actively involved in the sin. His... his um, Francis Chan is called, what is it called? Crazy Love. Oh, right. His organization is one of the partnering, he's partnering with Todd White. He's partnering with Lou Engel and some of the other people, Christ for the Nations, Very Daniel Kalinda. Mm -hmm. um, he says, we don't want the emotion, we don't want the hype. But that's exactly what they do. That's the whole thing. Right, it is the whole thing. You take away the loud music, and I'm not a, against loud music. I, I go to concerts, I have a great set of speakers in my house. I like Several listening to- Several sets of yes, speakers. <laughs> as you can see. But this is music being used to literally put people into a trance state so that they are susceptible to the message being taught. It's not the Holy Spirit. I, I'm gonna mention that probably a few times as mm -hmm. we go through this, but it's super obvious. If you just open your mind a little bit to consider, is what Steve's saying true? Is that actually what's happening? Yeah. Yeah, the evidence is, is is overwhelming. I'll even give you an example. I'll put the video in the link. Uh, some of you probably know about Rick Beato's channel. He's a really, really great YouTube channel if you like music. Uh, I'm a musician. I used to play in the praise band. I did all the stuff these people are doing. So that's why I, I talk and about it. And he observed it. it for over 20 years. I was on the stage manipulating people right. with my instrument. Mm -hmm. So I know what it's like. Um, <clears throat> he had a guest on... Oh, I, I forgot his name now, but he's a writer, music uh, journalist, uh, cri critic, and he is in favor of the ability of music to put people into a trance state. He studied other cultures, especially pagan cultures. This is not a Christian man talking about Christianity. He's talking yeah. about music and its power to put people into a trance state to help them 
be somehow healed or to feel better, to have so a more positive attitude. So you put that link attitude. in here too, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and he's teaching it as the problem with popular music today is that we have these very short pop songs and three or four minutes is not enough time for people to be induced into a hypnotic state. That's why you have to have at least 10 minutes. Wow. And this is what you see in a in a drum circle, in a voodoo uh, ritual. Right. They go for sometimes, you know, hours. Longer, right. And your heartbeat starts to change, your brain waves start to change, and now you are kind of canceling out your cognitive ability, your ability to think and reason, and you're now open to what the people are going to say. Okay, I decided to do a little bit of uh, inserting of some clips here to make this point really clear. Here's Matt Gilman, great, great singer. He actually is a worship leader, has worked with the International House of Prayer, and of course he was at the Send. That's why I'm talking about him in 2019. And I want you to see how this song he wrote, beautiful song, nothing wrong with the song, nothing wrong with the lyrics. It just has four simple chords and it just keeps repeating. It never really resolves. It just keeps playing like an endless loop. And what I want to demonstrate in this video is how they keep playing the same four chords, uh, actually for a total of over 16 minutes. I think, check, check, I think you would honor the Lord 
If all over this place it's almost impossible, can we bow our knees all over this stadium, thousands, saying, God, manifest your holiness to our generation. I'm taking out the audio for this section here because they're singing the song and it, it might be a violation of copyright if I just play it as it is. Let's bow before us and God. Show us your glory. Lift your voice and begin to cry. Show us the glory. Only the glory of God can save a generation. Show us your glory like Moses. Show us your glory like the book of Acts. Come, Lord, show us your glory. And we will cry out, here am I, send me. Show us your glory like you did to Isaiah. This idea of getting God to somehow show his glory is the very exact theme that you will hear Francis Chan talking about. And my guess is, at least to some extent, he got the idea directly from Lou Engel, uh, because this is a big theme that you hear from Lou Engel. Francis Chan was at this event, so it's quite possible that he heard Lou Engel saying these things. Let's stand before the presence of the Lord now. Just go, keep just a cappella, just sing. I have no idea why Lou Engel rocks back and forth almost constantly, but it is weird and kind of creepy. Father, we thank you for your presence. We pray the shade of your glory would rest over this whole community. Let the breeze of the Holy Spirit come and flood this place all day long. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we believe that we can start a spiritual revolution that will shift the history of the world. It's not just hype. It's not just hype. Okay, thanks for going with me on that bunny trail. I wanted you to see for yourself, uh, that was actually the second or the third song for the day. So they kept doing that same sort of practice for a total of about 12 hours. Now let's get back to my conversation with Paulette. And I think as a Christian, you could very easily make the leap to say, well, that would also be the place where you're susceptible to evil spirits right to enter into your thought process and right. to convince you of things that are actually uh, against your belief system so that's just some stuff to think about as we go into this in our inner being so that christ would dwell in our hearts god please father please hear us from heaven and change us you sit there. Cause us to be even you more in love with you. You sit give there. Us give us a more clear treats. picture of you tonight, God, that we would not stop worshiping. Not when we leave this tent. Not when we fall asleep. May we wake up with praises on our lips, God, because you've changed us and we're truly mm -hmm. spirit filled, God. Please, Lord, okay. make this of you. What does truly spirit filled mean? This is a really good question, and I think uh, there's a number of things he says that are declarative statements. This is so. This is true. Right. This is something that has to happen, but he doesn't give you any objective means of measuring those things. Right. So, do we want to be spirit-filled? Of course. That's a, that's a Christian thing. What does it mean? It's never defined. But Biblically, what does it mean? Well, to be a Christian is to be spirit-filled. There you go. Yeah. 
I, that's what I can't stand. It's right. like then we start putting, adding meaning to what scripture says because of kind of what we want to see and what we believe. We and went to a charismatic church for yes. a long time. Yes. So if you think that we're anti-charismatic and we don't know anything about this because we're old fogies. We've just, experienced it. We've yeah. done it. We wore the t-shirt. Got the t-shirt. Now we don't have the t-shirt. <laughs> Speak through your word, King Jesus. Okay, now that's really good. Speak through yes, your word, King course. Jesus. Now what you're going to see him do is he's going to he's going to speak through the word. Yes. He's going to do what's called eisegesis. Another way of saying it is something that uh, Daniel Long and I have started to use on our, our secondary channel, the, uh, the, the Wartburg Castle. Um, you're reading your presuppositions okay. into the text, or you're taking what you want to be in the text and you're putting it there when it's not really there on its own. So I, I let's say I want to I want to see pugs in the Bible. Yeah, I will try to find verses that somehow talk about having a short snout. Or, <laughs> you know, I'm, that's a ridiculous yeah, example. Yeah, it is. But but, but if you want get to, the idea. there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that's uh, maybe yeah. ambiguous enough if you don't know anything about Snuggle. it that you could claim that this is saying something when it's actually not saying right. those things at all. In your name we pray. Amen. You know I um. I have to I have to point this out because uh -huh. we've watched this several times. He mentioned Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. See when he mentions him again throughout this whole conversation. Excellent, excellent point. Just watch for it. When I was watching the worship in this tent, it was just insane. Like, the energy, the life, like you, I was like, I don't need to preach. Let's just do this all night. Let's just scream, shout. But then we got to save something for tomorrow. But I'm like, well... No, we don't have to save anything. Just just give it all. God will give us more. So he starts by saying, we don't want hype. We don't want emotion. Yeah, and that's where they were just at. And then now he's talking about how... No, you stay here. I guess what he said just there is God will give them more. I, I, I've said this before. Francis Chan, if you watch okay, this, here. or one of your people watch this, I want you to make these kind of declarative okay. statements... And I want you to go to an event where there is no electricity, there is no right. band, there is no PA system, there's just people sitting around. And I know that Francis Chan has been in that environment because he's been in third world countries. And this environment is about a version of hype. Now, right. you could call it Christian hype. You could even say it's sincere hype. And, and these are all sincere Christians. But it is hype nonetheless. So it's really disingenuous right. to say we don't want the hype, we don't want the emotion. And yet at the same time, you're cheering on Nothing but a lot of hype and emotion. You know, that's the way it works, right? You don't hold it back. But as I was looking at all of that energy, I was thinking, God, and my, I started praying for you. I'm like, God, could they have this type of passion every morning when they're alone? Right? When they're alone. So can you actually have passion without showing hype? And showing excitement and showing some kind of inner groaning and outer groaning. Uh, how do you measure these things? Uh, I mean, the people are feeling something real. That's right. Whether it's a genuine move of the Holy Spirit or not is a we different don't question. Know. Yeah, but it's there is there is a real feeling. These right. people. Okay, everybody knows this. Whether you've really thought about it or not, you know this. Why do people go to a football game? With 60,000 people as opposed to energy. watching it at it's home. It's the energy it's of right. all the people. You're, exactly. in, you're in the middle of it. Yeah. That works here as well. Yeah. So he's saying that you should be able to muster that up on your own at home. Can you? I, I, I don't think so because it's not if the same can, thing. If you can, you can't maintain it. It's not sustainable. And what does that have to do with your relationship with Christ? The underlying assumption to me is the most important thing about your relationship with God is... It has to be... Uh, Something you feel. It, well, you have to feel it, and it has to be at the highest possible level of human passion right. and emotion. And if it, if it isn't, you're doing something wrong, and God's disappointed with you. There is no place for you to be a normal Christian living a normal life, because that, by definition, is not a really good Christian life at all. So you're constantly getting heaped with this thing of, you've got to... Do something else. You've got to do something else. And, you know, we were talking about this, obviously, um, as we were going through this. And our generation... 
you know, we went to summer camp. We went to weekend camp where they did all this. And I remember a friend they of mine. They didn't do this no, as much, no. but you were, you were. Engaged kind in of, this. In a concentrated. Right. You know, it was more than a church service. It was it was uh, all day Youth or all weekend, week. Yeah, and with music and people with all good teaching. intentions. Absolutely. And we learned stuff, and I'm thankful for those things. But there was always the issue of what happens on Monday when you go back to your normal right. life with your family and your normal it's church. It's not sustainable, and right. it really hadn't taught us. You know, we always kind of lived for the next time. In another four months, we get to go to another, you know, service. So what I think about is now people our age are now the leaders and now they're spreading it to groups of kids mm -hmm. for generations. And that's not real life. Well, I mean, you right? could... That's not how you live. You could ask the question, where in the Bible are we supposed to have... Well, yeah, you got a church and you go to church. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's all about... But... Right. That's not enough. Conferences. It's all you, about conferences. You got to go to the big meeting. With the, it, this is like Amway. We were it at Amway is. in the late 90s. We yes. know exactly what it feels like to think you're super, super special. It's you're, all about you. You're the one group that really knows what's going right. on. You're going to change the world. And then you find out that, no, it's just a bunch of people making money off of you. Right. I'm not saying that he's doing that, no. but but there is a lot of disappointment around the corner for people involved in, the, in these okay. sorts of movements. Now we'll let it go in for their a while. rooms, can they wake up going... <gasps> Lion of Judah, you know, like, come, speak to me, meet with me. Okay, so he doesn't want us to be all emotional, but he is, by definition, making every point he makes through emotion. If you actually wrote these things mm -hmm. down and just read them out... Mm -hmm. It would mean none. I mean, it would mean something, it would, but it wouldn't it would, be. It wouldn't have the punch that it has with this. His whole thing about being this great speaker has to do with him doing this all the time. Yeah. If I just said what I said, he does this all the time. Here she comes. Doesn't it doesn't mean as much, but it, it's the same words. So he is, by definition, a, a incredibly emotional speaker. Yep. Like, to have this energy with this belief, like, no, God, I want to meet with you in my room right now, 6 a.m., 5 a.m., whatever. All about what I'm no one you else to do, is God. around because nothing is greater than being with you and seeing your face and that hunger for that. Because too often we get fired up in a place like this. Yeah, of course they do. And then the right. next morning comes. And you're sitting by yourself. So now he's blaming them for going home and not feeling the same way they felt when they were in a stadium with tens of thousands of people. <coughs> right. So he's already guilt tripping them. It's Thursday. They haven't even brow got beating. to the event yet. Yeah, brow beating. Thank you. And he's telling them, no, no. Yeah, you're going to get hyped up because that's what we do here. That's right. what this organization is all about. But can you have this on your own? You should. You should. No, actually, if you're you a shouldn't. real Christian if like me, because yeah. <laughs> I want this all the time and what I a, practice it all the time. What about you? What a recipe for disaster! Right, and oh. I think that's why we get so upset about it, because we know lives that have gotten ruined by it, and mm -hmm. we know people's lives continue to get ruined by it. I just noticed something. Uh oh! During the day, this microphone, I move it out of the way so I don't hit my head on it. Here he goes. But then I forgot to bring it down. Forgot to bring it down. Okay, let's see if we can get Ginger to sit by her sister. You're bringing the monk down. Ma yeah. <laughs> there you go, honey. Okay. If you sit here for a little bit longer, you Now we more. sound better, don't we? I probably can't do. tell the difference. And you wait. Hey, hey, oh, hey, yeah. hey, hey, get back. Oh, yeah, back. she's just... Get back, Jack. You got her trained. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> she's 10, what can I say? Pebbles is like, I'm better than her. <laughs> Watch me. I'll show you. She's You'll be proud one. of me. Yeah, yeah, she is. She's totally the compliant one. This one's a little feisty. She's feist. a little feistier. She's a feistier. In your room. Yes, you are. And suddenly, you guys, Stay. it can't Stay. be the worship team that gets you fired up. <laughs> Stay. Now they're clapping. It is the object of our worship that fires us up. That's, a, that's an excellent point he's making. Yeah, it is. <laughs> if what you're saying, Francis Chan, is, is so central... Then why do you have to have these events? Why are you participating in these events? Why are you promoting the very thing that you're right now speaking against? I mean, he's he's sort of saying that, yeah, you're getting all hyped up by this, these bands that I am helping to support, that I am a part of sponsoring. My organization is helping to put this thing together, but you shouldn't be depending on these. Th well, why are you doing this? It's so contradictory. Yeah. So like, so then what? What's better? What will do this then? 
Well, he's saying it should be the, the object of your worship is the focus. I totally agree. Absolutely. And so if you demonstrate go, that for us, if you go to a church that does that, yeah, why is that not enough? Why right. why is that not even an issue? Right. It's not even mentioned that you should be going to a church on no. a regular basis where God is the object of worship. It's a great point. It's like there's just an assumption. Well, that doesn't do anything. Right. Church. It's all you. It's all you or it's this movement. It's this thing that's coming that, right. that, that, that they've been talking about for many, many decades. Okay. It is us recognizing what he has done for us that causes us to wake up no matter who's around or not. And we just wake up and go, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who Second has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every Christ. spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. That's right. We just start worshiping him. That's what a spirit-filled person does. The Bible says, and he's always giving thanks for everything. I don't know, okay, a lot of you guys know, like, this is what I've been doing for the last 30 years, going from conference to conference to event to event. I've probably been to, I've been to thousands of Christian gatherings, mm -hmm. and I have never been more excited about an event than I am about tomorrow, okay? Applause line. You guys... <laughs> Uh, we have a new Francis Chan drinking game. <laughs> Again, this, we don't really do drinking games, but no. Steve seems to think that this is kind of every making he, a good point. Every time he says, you guys, yeah, have, have a sip of water or whatever. Whatever. I, I'm being serious. Look through all my messages. I've never said that before. I am seriously, like, it is another level. I have never seen... It's, it's a different category. You guys heard the stories of what Mike was saying about the prophetic, you know, history of what's leading up to tomorrow. You got to hear last night from a dear friend, Christy Brent, who talked about the last send gathering and being healed of 38 years of neurological Lyme's disease. You, you, you're hearing these stories, you're experiencing this, you feel the energy in this room, and we're, you know... You're hearing these stories. You're feeling the, the energy, energy experienced in this room. What is that? Is that a um, an emotional thing? It kind of sounds like it, doesn't it? Oh, it's, it can't be. No, because he just told you that you this shouldn't. Is not it's not about, about it. emotion. No. So Andy and I are just looking at each other, going, "What in the world are we a part of?" Like. Okay, so they did this in Amway. Ah. Oh. What are we doing? We're this, part of something bigger than oh, ourselves. And you guys it. get to be a part of it mm -hmm. too, only if you do what you're supposed to do. Because we had the vision and we saw it and now we're imparting it to you. Aren't but boy, you lucky? Aren't you lucky? And you can't be up here because we were the ones that thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> so many years of prayer have gone into this and now it's happening and it's happening tomorrow. Sounds like hype. Okay? You think? And... But if you're like me, mm -hmm. you're impatient and you go, I don't want to wait till tomorrow. God, I want to experience you right now. So we're going to be stopping this a lot. What, is it, what does that literally mean? I want to experience you right now. I, and I'm not being right. uh, rhetorical. Yes. I'm not just saying. You're asking that, the question. What does that mean? Right. I want to experience him right now. Right. We've been hearing that forever. What, what would that look like? If somebody said, I know for a fact that I experienced him right now, what would they describe? I, I, I literally don't know. I know that they would say, I felt this or I felt that, but they wouldn't be able to say anything with clear boundaries. It was this and it was this, but it wasn't that and it wasn't that. It's, it's always this ambiguous thing. And it always involves having a praise band <laughs> or a guy figure. yelling. Go figure. Usually both. I don't know if tomorrow's going to come. If I want as much of Jesus and his presence here in this tent that we can have right now. I want his grace to fall on us in a way that we've never experienced. Okay, we listened to this earlier and I stopped it at the same place. We want as, as much grace 
More, more grace than we've ever experienced. So before he even said that, mm -hmm. when he said, tomorrow may not come, so let's do this, I'm like, well, if tomorrow doesn't come, then you're obviously in the presence of Jesus. How much better is that? Mm -hmm. So why even say, well, tomorrow may not come, so we want God today. It's like, well, if tomorrow doesn't come, that means you're, you're all with dead. God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just... I don't think he thought it through, but he was just saying you that. You know what? There's a lot of things he didn't think no, through. No, I don't. As in grace. Well, Again, I'm, I'm saying... Words have meaning. You, yeah, words mean something. should mean something. Yes. They should. They do. In, Eventually, we'll get that on a mug. Yeah. Once Steve has some free time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, now I forgot what he said. I'm sorry. Let me... Sorry. I butt in. I can't back this up very easily. We can have right now. I want his grace to fall on us in a way that we've never experienced. I want his grace to fall on us in a way that we've never experienced. Experience. Again. What does grace mean? Well, in the Bible, yeah. grace is describing the unmerited gift that we've been given, the gift through, of salvation through Christ. That's right. He died on the cross that's to atone for our sins. Absolutely. So we are treated as righteous even though we're not. It's the right. imputed righteousness of Christ is a thing that describes, or I should say grace describes that. Grace is a way of saying, here's something you don't deserve, and I'm going to just give it to you. That's grace. But he's taking grace and he's making a different definition out of it. I don't know what it is. I right. literally don't. He wants his grace to fall. What, like okay, never what, before. What would that mean that grace fell? <laughs> I, I, I want grace somebody died to explain. last year. <laughs> grace. Grace. She passed away 30 years ago. Sorry. <laughs> Christmas vacation. Grace died last year. No. <laughs> um. So, yeah. I, I I know it seems like we're super, super nitpicky, this guy. But the more we watch this, the more we tried to understand it, the more we saw how disjointed yeah. his thoughts were. And it's like, okay, if words do have meaning and scripture has meaning with those words, what are they? And is he using them the correct way? Otherwise, there's a lot of confusion. Mm -hmm. And confusion does not bring about the peace of God right. or the will of God. I mean, it's... it's, it's it hurts people, ultimately. It hurts people. And it really does hurt people to be whipped up into this incredibly emotional feeling frenzy feeling yeah thinking something is absolutely true like you've never thought something was and true it doesn't before happen. and it doesn't happen so then what happens next in many cases people abandon their faith right. or they at least stop going to church altogether and they they just kind of go i don't know anything for sure anymore and i just i don't care which i'm, I'm and, emotionally drained by this whole thing which that's what again happens. we've gone through it mm -hmm. our kids have gone through it we've seen their friends gone go through it and so that's probably why we're so hypersensitive to this yes. we're like why is this happening? And then now we see it and possibly why it's happening. <clears throat> and we want to present it and point things out. So um, I'll take just another little bunny trail here. Yeah. But the background to IHOP yeah. involves Paul Cain and Bob Jones, who were supposed to be these great prophets of God who spoke directly on behalf of God and said these amazing things okay. that all came true. They were, they were creepy. Super creepy. And... Uh, I just recorded an interview today with a couple of experts who came out of the William Branham Latter Rain cult, which is directly connected to Paul Kane and Bob Jones, Interesting. which leads to the IHOP movement. Mike Bickle is either the most clueless person in the world who has no idea what he's promoting or he's he's wicked, and I don't I don't see him as a wicked man, but I I think he's at best super clueless, because mm -hmm. there is a really dark, seedy, evil underbelly that uh, we'll be able to get into more detail in the months ahead, and it really disturbs me, and to see a guy like Francis Chan pulling mainstream evangelicalism towards the hyper charismatic New Apostolic Reformation Word of Faith version of Christianity is disturbing. Yeah. And I, I, again, I don't know his heart. I, I'm guessing that he's sincere and clueless, just like I think Mike Bickle and a lot and of these people And what are. I'd like to say is, with all the research you've done and the people you've spoken to, you're peeling back the onion. Yeah. To say, okay, the onion is here. How did we get here? Well, there's this layer. And then there's this. So then what is the foundation of how we got to today? Just, and that's uh, what he is discovering. Okay, so IHOP was supposedly started by these prophecies that were given through the Kansas City prophets. Uh, I, I'm probably going to explain this yeah. not with 100% accuracy because I'm trying to do it real so quickly. See, yeah, quick. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Kane had this uh, supposedly supernatural ability to speak about the future like a fortune teller would. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
and it seems evil. It seems like he was actually gifted. If he w was as gifted as they say he was, it was not because of God. Because in his life, he was treated like absolute royalty. But behind the scenes, he was actually a homosexual and an and a alcoholic. Wow. And he was confronted about this very late in life, near the end of his life. In the early 2000s, this came out. And people tried to say to him, you got to stop going out there and being in ministry. You're, you're a wreck. You're a sinful man, and you you haven't repented. And he said, "Don't tell me what to do. I'm a great prophet. I can do what I want." Wow. Um, he was seeing male prostitutes. This is not a guy who had an indiscretion one day. Right. This is a, a a man with tremendous wickedness in his background, and he is at the foundation to a pretty large extent. Large degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Bob Jones is just as creepy. Uh, maybe not as creepy, but similarly creepy. And these are the things that I won't go into detail about today, but I just, but I just want you guys who are yeah. who are listening to us thinking I'm you know I'm on, on this weird tangent. The International House of Prayer is a very disturbing organization. Yes, there are sincere people. Absolutely, mm -hmm. there are sincerely deluded people. Right. Uh, and there's also some really creepy aspects to it as well. Anything can happen. You know, one of the one of the passages that's been on Andy's heart and he's been sharing with the collab is uh, is one of my favorite stories. Actually, is First Samuel fourteen. Here we go. If you know First Samuel fourteen, that's when the Israelites are terrified because they see this Philistine army. There are thirty. Okay, first of all, the is the army of Israel. They had like six hundred people with no weapons 600 people with no weapons and the philistines are coming at them and the philistines it says they have 30,000 chariots 6,000 horsemen and they said an army that looked like the sand on the seashore and israel had 600 with no weapons and that's from 1 Samuel 13. And so what do they do? They hide. Okay? So what I would do, I would hide. So everyone does this. But then you see this story in 1 Samuel 14 where there's a guy named Jonathan, the son of, of, of uh, Saul. And uh, listen to this. And You've got it right. First Samuel 14, <clears throat> Saul, I mean Saul, not Jonathan, looks at his armor bearer. They're the only two guys that have weapons, according to Scripture. The only guys on the army, and here's 36,000 on horses and chariots and then tons of soldiers. And here's what Jonathan says. He looks at his, Jonathan said in verse 16, to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. <laughs> I love the story. He said 14, 16. Okay, we're back. We got water. And we she's got using my Galatians girl cup. Because... She's the Galatians girl. <laughs> I think that's been her problem. She's thirsty. Okay. Um... Got it, girl. Got it, girl. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Um, let me read it from the NASB. Okay. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Basically, he's saying the Lord will save us against the enemy. Right. It's not about salvation. 
It's about being saved from your enemy. In, and in, whether in it's just two of us or mm -hmm. a group, God can do anything he wants. Right. And so he had faith to say God could use us. In the New Living Translation, which is a lot more uh, you know, easy to understand English, Let's go again to see those pagans, Jonathan said his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. Okay. So that's the point of the verse. All right. Perhaps God will help us in this battle mm -hmm. against the Philistines. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has to do with people going to the send? Prescriptive or descriptive? Well, that's a story. It's describing what happened. So it's descriptive. He's going to use it as prescriptive. If you wanted to, then you could take any verse, any story of the many, many like stories. Like what? Uh, we were having, trying to have some fun, fun with this earlier. Yeah. I forgot what we came up with. What was <laughs> we it? came up with several different things. You uh, said pretty close by. I didn't write that. Oh, yeah, down. when, when uh, Samuel anoints David. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, Women, you looking for a man? Yeah, find one who's ruddy. Ruddy, for you, D-D-Y. Because that's what David was. Well, and he, he had uh, the stamp of approval of God. He was anointed. So who wouldn't want that for a husband? Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. Huh. I think I'm going to take that one verse right there, and I'm going to apply it to myself. You can't, because you're already married. No, no. I'm not talking about marriage. I want to anoint myself. <laughs> I mean, I want God to anoint me. Oh, there you and go. And I'm going to use this verse to prove that I am anointed by God to be whatever I want to be. Oh, so we're looking at that. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, yeah, what we were saying is, um, so he sent him and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Well, <laughs> that doesn't apply to me. No. Uh, so this is, this is a specific text talking about how the Lord specifically was pointing out David to be the future king, mm -hmm. even though he was young. Mm -hmm. he, Samuel didn't even think he was worth looking at. Right. So that's a very, it's a wonderful, amazing story. But it's not something we can apply to ourselves in any way because right. it's not about us. No, We're it's not about David. It's about David. Right. And it's about God continuing to keep the line going so that we could eventually get to the Messiah through the Israelite people. Right. And which Jonathan and his armor bearer are now wanting to go forward and slay the Philistines right. to save. So... God honors to, that to because the, he's one, he's honoring his promise to keep the Israelite people going. To, exactly they because are the special, he already chosen people. He already kind of said okay enough with Saul. Yeah, he yeah. he took out you know he took away his approval or anointing from Saul. I mean, if you keep reading in that chapter before and after, you see that Samuel says, you know, you you did what you wanted and it's sin and and God is not pleased and your his favor is now taken away. Thank you. Okay. See if I have the coffee bag open right there and, yeah. I, and I sip water? You pretend. Yeah. I can still go to sleep at night because we're doing, we're doing this at night. Oh, we got coffee beans. I'm going to have a couple. Two guys. One guy's looking at his armor bear. He goes, I've got an idea. Just you and me. Let's go. It's just 30,000 chariots, 6,000 men on horses. Tons of soldiers, but I love what he says. He says, it may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. That's faith. Okay? Now what I want to point out about this is what... Jonathan's exact words are. Here we go. He says, it may, may be. be. Some of your Bibles will say, perhaps. Mm -hmm. He says, hey, let's go over there and God might. It may be that he would take the two of us and defeat thousands of people. I love that phrase, it may be. Because Jonathan didn't know. He goes, it's not up to me. I can't just say, God, follow me. We're going to go and we're going to do this. He goes, let's go over there and we'll just see if God wants us to attack them. Okay? So let's just go over there and then we'll find out. You guys, this is so important. 
Because too often we can speak with arrogance about things God has not promised. Okay? Oh boy. Here we go. Well, this entire movement is doing that very thing. They constantly claim to be speaking that God told them to do this, that, and the other thing. For the reason? Well, it's supposed to be to expand the kingdom of God. End to, time revival. For this end time revival. Where is that in scripture? It is not in scripture. There you go. Yeah. The, I mean, it, when I learned that, it was like... It's really hard to take is. them seriously because, uh, as an example, I've been trying to trace back where did that originally come from. Mm -hmm. And um, in the 1950s, there was a, a healing movement that was largely started because of William Branham, who was a con man, a very slimy, disgusting con man. And again, I'm not going to go into detail, but I know a lot. Um, the letter rain movement was largely a movement that started because of William Branham. Gordon Lindsay was one of the big promoters of William Branham and this movement. And I'm almost positive that the idea that there's this billion soul harvest came out of some of the leaders from that time period and that movement. And I believe that when Bob Jones made those statements in the 80s, maybe as early as 76, I believe he was repeating what he had heard going back a couple decades earlier. Okay, I decided to look a little bit further into this Billion Soul Harvest thing, and I remembered this book that I had uh, purchased, I don't know, five years ago. Really, really good book. Edith Blumhofer is a really good historian, and here's what she wrote. In 1955, the Assemblies of God Evangelist A.A. A. Allen announced an ambitious plan, the Billion Souls Crusade. The so-called miracle ministries of Allen, T.L. Osborne, Velmer Gardner, and Gordon Lindsay were poised, Allen reported, to conduct a crusade that would, quote, bring Jesus back. They billed it as the greatest thing that has ever been announced, a billion souls for Christ, the Assemblies of God minister Gordon Lindsay mused. So this idea, uh, at least to some extent, started in the 1950s with the group of men in the Healing Crusades, which came out of the New Order of the Latter Rain Movement in the late 40s. I decided to do a quick search on YouTube, and I just found this recent video. It's an interview with Mike Bickle, where he claims that he heard Leonard Ravenhill talking about the Billion Soul Harvest, and Leonard Ravenhill got the idea from the writer uh, from uh, the turn of the previous century, E.M. Bounds. And, of course, Mike Bickle did talk about his uh, kind of mentor, strange prophetic mentor, Bob Jones, who passed away in 2014, but who had been claiming there was going to be this billion soul harvest going back to 1975 or 76. Uh, I'm doing this off the top of my head. I know that Bob Jones made that prediction in the 70s, okay. but I'm pretty sure it goes back to the latter rain movement and the healing movement, the so-called healing movement. And why is that important? Because these ideas are not coming from the Bible. They're coming from a movement that has very dark roots okay. with a lot of heresy and a lot of uh, fraudulent and heretical teaching and teachers as a core part of the movement. And if your foundation is not built on something that's that... A, that's a foundation of sand for right. sure. Yeah. So they keep building on it. And, and we just, it's a hearsay, and it's like, well, it must happen, yep. and it must be true. I mean, I went through that. Oh, yeah, there's an end-time harvest. I and heard that I looked, somewhere. And um, when I looked in Scripture, it talked about the great falling away, not right. an end-time harvest. And, of course, we want to see people saved and go to heaven with us, of course. And we need to pray for that and work towards that. And but are, the there, fact is... There are people that say, oh, no, there's both. They say there's a falling away and there's a harvest. I'm like, okay, but I don't see that. Right. You think if it, two things were going to happen at the same time... The verses that talk about the falling Scripture away would, would also us. say, and mm -hmm. there will also be a great revival. Right. So make sure you're part of that great revival and not the falling away. All it talks about is the falling away. So. Right. Anyway. Hey, no we don't know what he's going to do tomorrow. Okay? We have to have a humility in this tent right now. Where we just, in obedience, that's what this has all been about. Andy, you know, years ago... Heard that the Lord was saying, Kansas City, okay, we'll go to Kansas City, we'll just try this. You know, it may be that God wants us to do a SEND conference in Kansas City. And then tomorrow is the plan, and it may be that it's actually going to happen. And it may be 
that God actually shows up and moves in a way that blows our minds. Okay, and again, I want to ask, what would that look like? Right. How, uh, would you, how do you measure that he did show up, and how do you measure that for sure you know that the minds were blown? Jesus was God incarnate. Enough. I mean, that's God. He already came. Yeah, but we need to have their minds blown, honey. So that's so not... So the God, a creator of the universe, right? coming to earth in human flesh and dying on the cross for our sins. Yeah, that was a long time ago. We now need, what we need, we need something new and, ref, and, and we, fresh. We need him to show up and blow our minds. So <laughs> what dragged me what? into the... It blows my mind. <laughs> the, the whole charismatic movement was going to that women's retreat and nothing to do with my church because we weren't going to a charismatic church. But it was a charismatic women's retreat and the whole idea of maybe God will show up in a way that we we're weren't, not we're, we're expecting. It's, or we've never seen before uh -huh. and then we're going to miss it. Because so, you're not open to it. You're, right. not, you're, you're putting God in the box by because thinking. Because we're thinking it's going to be like the Bible. Mm -hmm. But God's not bigger than the Bible. Oh, yeah, he's going to do something new and fresh and different. So, so that Wrong thinking, wrong, wrong foundation. Foundation led us down a long, dark path with t shirts we no longer wear. Thank God. Right? But that's not up to me. That's the crazy thing about the sand. So much time and money and work has gone into tomorrow, and yet it's all dependent on one person. You know what? That always bothers me. He keeps saying that one person. It's not one person. They're looking for the creator of the universe. Why doesn't he acknowledge that instead of person? Person means it's a created being. Kind of sounds like it, I know. It is. It confusing. really bothers me. Crazy? Like, it may be that the Lord decides, I'm going to pour my grace on those people. What does that mean? Right. Words have meaning, folks. He's going to pour his grace on those people. Right. Now, what he did through Jesus. If you want to give him some credit here, okay. and I do, uh, he is saying something that I think has application. The idea that we don't tell God what to do. We don't expect certain things to happen because we plan those things to happen. That's, right. a, that's actually a really Valid. healthy thing. Mm -hmm. But again, he's part of an organization is, is doing the opposite of what he claims is important. They, they have marketing people. They have videographers. They make these highly poly... I, mean, I made a video about this just a month and a half ago where I was really critical of him in this video that was... Walking up the mountain. Yeah, it was, it was incredibly uh, hypey. Is that a word? It could be. <laughs> it is now. It was, it was like... Staged uh, yeah, and... Yeah, it was marketing. Right. It was using every trick in the book. And I think there are honestly some pretty smart young people who eventually go... Man, I can't believe I fell for mm -hmm. that. That was just a commercial mm -hmm. with a Christian veneer, but it was still a type of commercial. It mm -hmm. was I was being marketed to. I bought into it. I went to these events for a while. I got all hyped up. Nothing really happened, and I couldn't sustain it, and nobody really answered my tough questions, mm -hmm. and now I don't even know if I want to go to church anymore because they didn't promote church anyway. Right. These people don't promote church. I'm not, I'm not saying they're against church per right. se, but everything that they're doing creates an environment where you look at church like, eh, okay, I guess I... I went to the real thing. Yeah, yeah. Church is okay, but this I is, need this. And I know for a fact that's one of the biggest problems with IHOP is these young people go there and they're getting the subliminal, if not outright, message that when you go home, you know, those people in your church, even your own parents, they don't get it. They don't get it. So... Just kind of feel sorry for them and don't expect much from them and don't really listen to what they have to say because mm -hmm. they're not part of this movement. But, you know, hopefully someday they will. But in the meantime, you're part of the special group. Right. It's just super harmful. And, I, and again, I don't think anybody's saying that outright. I think, but that's right. the message that is being sent over and over again. Okay. But it's not up to me. If, if he chooses to. And that's why I love this phrase. He goes... If God wants to, he can take the two of us. He goes, why? I mean, how many does God need to defeat an army of 36,000? Right? I, I mean, his logic was so good. 
He goes, it's, it's not up to us. He goes, God could save with a lot and he could save with a few. I mean, there could be another conference, you know, in Wichita or something, you know, with four people and they called themselves Send Junior. And it could be that if God decided, I'm going to bless those four over there, I'd rather be with those four. I, I, again, I'd I, rather be with those four. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, because he's that on. four. There you go. God could choose that smaller group. And he'd rather be there. No, he's saying God would. God says that. That's he's speaking in, as if he were God. I see. He's saying it's possible that God would say, "I like those four yeah. people than the tens of thousands of people." And in the I'd stadium. rather be there. Again, he's totally skipping the idea of what if God isn't looking for a stadium full of people to begin with? What if God has established the Christian Church as the place where He promises to be? Right. In the body of Christ. You gonna read that thing in Matthew, where Jesus said. Yeah, Jesus, eighteen twenty. Behold, I am with you. Hang on, this is at the very end. I, you know what? I think I need like Coke bottle glasses because this is not helpful. Eighteen twenty. <laughs> Jesus said, "For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them." So, if you're looking to find Jesus, if there's two or three, that's one verse that gives you the verse. indication that it's not that difficult. Right. <laughs> okay, and then we're looking at. Hang on. I'm a little. Uh, You're talking about the Great scraps. Commission passage, right? Then that's John, I think, one fourteen eighteen. No, that's a different one, I think. Okay. Oh, maybe, maybe you're right. Hmm, John one fourteen. Oh, no, the Great Commission. You're talking about the end. Yeah, that would be. Isn't that Matthew? Didn't you say? Um, hang on. That was I. I think I might have taken my um. One out of that for the Great Commission. I had all these little... I'll have a system eventually. Yeah, here it is. The end of Matthew. End of Matthew. Now the eleven disi uh, disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came, to, came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is promising to be with us always till the end. And what's interesting, he says, go therefore, make disciples, baptizing, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Okay. One of the things that Jesus taught was the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. We never hear them talk about the God of the universe right. who told us how to pray. Right. That's not that important because no one ever talks about the Lord's Prayer. And I, I just, that floors me. I know. We go to a church that usually does every week. We does say it every it. week. And why not? Because it's God of the universe. It's, he says, Jesus said, this is how you pray. That's right. Well, that's not what he meant. Well, that's actually, exactly kind of seems like said. it is what he said. <laughs> You know, so, and I, uh, we want more of his grace to fall down yeah. than we've ever experienced. Those words, we to want me, to be blown away. Th those words are literally meaningless. They're meaningless. I'm not trying to poke fun. No. I'm saying that they literally are meaningless, and everybody gets to fill them with whatever meaning they want them to have. Right. It's like an empty container, and you fill it with whatever you want. This whole thing is very ambiguous. It is, and that hurts people. It ultimately hurts people. And yes. I miss fun yelling with you and everything, but I want the presence of God. We have the presence of mm -hmm. God. Yeah. All right. But the faith that he says, that he uses, and those who don't, um, who don't know the story is, sure enough, they get there, and God's like, go on up. You know, the sign happened, and the people called them up, and these two people are Hold stealing on. this war. And Come here, speak. God's like, go on up. Hey. You know, the sign happened and the people called them up and these two people are scaling this wall and they they kill like 20 people. But then everything got chaotic. The ground starts shaking. All the soldiers are panicking and they're just screaming and they're fighting each other. And suddenly everyone's looking at going, what's causing that? And they realize that's Jonathan and his armor bearer. 
the two people that had faith in the power of God. And so then the army starts following them. And then suddenly the rest of the crowds, you know, come out of the holes in the ground and everything else. You go, yeah, we got you. But it was just those two people. And so I, I really have to ask you, where is your faith tonight? Is it a humble faith that says, God, there is nothing we can do to cause real life change tomorrow. But God, if you decide to move, it could be that God would stir thousands of people to go to the nations. He could do that, right? It could be that he would cause thousands of people to adopt a child. See, I can hype up a crowd. We, this whole team, especially the YWAM crowd, they can all yell and get everyone He's yelling. He's not it's not about and, hype. You know, yes, exactly. Um, but the follow through it takes to actually adopt a child out of the foster system and care for them day and night, 24 seven, that's an act of God that has to happen in a person's heart. Okay, I, I'm a million times in favor of adopting children and all this. It's just weird that they're combining that with this revival thing and going out and preaching the gospel and laying this kind of guilt trip on people that says, well, yeah, you're clapping and cheering, yeah, but are you actually gonna do it? Well, they're already at this event. They're right. already showing all the... Sacrificing time. Yeah, they're already giving all the support, and now you're kind of pre-scolding them right. for the thing that you're pretty sure they're not going to do right. because this isn't the norm. You get a giant room full of people cheering and clapping because you worked them up. Right, either, hype. Either, it's hype. Either you directly or the organization that you're a part of, and then you are surprised and yeah. kind of angry at them for getting hyped up and not following through. It's just weird. Yeah, it is. It's really weird. Are you blocking the screen? No, you're fine. We can all scream, throw up our shoes, and say, I'm going to go to the ends of the earth. But then to actually... If you haven't seen this, by the way, this is their new thing that they do at every one of these events. They all take off their shoes and hold them up in the air and scream and yell, and the crowd goes mad. Huh. It's like when someone has a touchdown in football. <laughs> <laughs> Only this is how you show your commitment. That's so sad. It's weird. I suppose on a really hot day and you've been standing in a stadium for eight hours, it feels really good to take your shoes off for a while. So it's about like, yeah, whatever they say, I just... I wanna, want to get out of here. Wanna, <laughs> my, my feet are sweaty, so this is nice. Thank you. <laughs> and the more I wave them, the more I cool off my shoes until I have to put them on again. <laughs> and I have a fan waving my head. Yeah, I, but it's... Yeah, okay. ...actually go, and when it's twice the temperature of this tent, and you're bit by all sorts of things, and no one's listening to you, the, the power to keep going, that has to be an act of God. We can all hang out and hold hands and say, we're unified, but what about afterwards? When I get on your nerves, you get on my nerves, and we're actually living in community with each other, and our sin comes out, then do we have the power to... Hang on a second. Our sin comes out. Except for Todd White. Todd White says we don't sin anymore. Right. So obviously... He hasn't, he hasn't kept up with... Francis Chan hasn't, hasn't achieved what... Todd White is capable of. Right. Yeah. ...to bear with one another and stay united. Now, what he's talking about are examples of our ability to do things that we should be doing. Our ability to follow through and keep up with our commitments. Yeah. But he's phrasing it in a way that it's similar to God doing a miraculous thing in enabling two men to <clears throat> right. win a battle against thousands. So what would you call that? It's like two different categories. Right. He's saying, yeah, you're here and getting all hyped up, but are you really going to adopt a child? Huh? Are you? Yeah, you're here and you're all hyped up about going to the mission field, but are you really going to go to the mission field? Well, are you talking about scolding people because they're not going to follow through? Or, or are you talking about God perhaps doing a miraculous thing that only he can do? Right. He's combining them as if they were the same thing. Right. So if he's talking about God stepping in and doing the thing that we cannot do, right. why is he also scolding them? Right. If it's up to God, 
Right. Why is he telling them that, you know, basically you guys are all... <laughs> you're all... You, you're saying one thing, but you're doing another. We see this. But it's ultimately what God decides to do if he perhaps shows up. It's really but disjointed. It, it is. And it's saying one thing and then saying another, and they're contradictory in each other. Yes. Contradicting? Yes. Yeah. In God's name, right? But if the Lord wills, it may be that God shows up tomorrow. Okay, but again, if what God shows up So, in other words, here's what you can do. Mm -hmm. If you're a young person and you went to this event and you don't want to go to the mission field, you want to have a regular job and have a family and, you know, just be a regular Christian, you can say, oh, God didn't show up for me because Francis Chan gave me permission. He said... Perhaps God will show up and enable you to go to the mission field and do this incredible, difficult thing, but maybe he won't. Yeah, he didn't. Not for me. I don't want to go to the mission field. He's kind of leaving that door wide open. But at the same time, he's saying, how dare you come here and get all hyped up about doing these things, but you're not really going to do them. And he'll say that even further down, remember? Mm -hmm. And some of you are just happy. feel so stirred for your campus that you go back to your campus and you start a club and no one shows up the first week and you don't care. You might sit there with your guitar and just worship him because God really put it in your heart. Okay? And it wasn't the hype and everything, but God actually showed up to the send and changed your heart and said, worship me and you worship me even if no one else worships me. And you preach that gospel even if you're rejected over and over. It could be that this could happen tomorrow. Do you believe that it could happen? It, it, it doesn't matter if they believe, because you're talking about God supernaturally acting and doing something in other people, or doing something in themselves. But it's only going to happen if you believe. So which is it? Is it God supernaturally coming into the send and doing these amazing things that we are incapable of doing? Mm -hmm. Or is it, you, you better do it. You better believe and try really hard. The, this is like the fourth time now. Right. And it gets worse. Yes, the it more does. I listen to it, the more I realize how it doesn't actually make sense. Could you have been like Jonathan? <sighs> Prescriptive, I descriptive. An army of 36,000 on chariots and horses. And you look at your buddy and go, let's go. <coughs> um, Thanks for hanging with us so yeah, long. <laughs> this is... This is a really long and painful one, but I it hope is. you guys find this useful. Right. If you want to show that you have faith, here's the one thing that we can all agree to. Is you say, yeah, I, uh, I need to be sorrowful over my sins. Mm -hmm. I need to see myself as I really am. I need to be um, reminded on a daily basis that I have a tendency to always keep veering towards selfishness and sinfulness right. and arrogance and self-righteousness and all of these problems. And I know that every time I... And self-pity. And self-pity. How many millions of people do that? Yep. There's a, there's a bunch of examples of, a, can of, identify. Our, of right. our sinful nature. Absolutely. And the one thing that we can show belief towards is not just those sinful aspects, but the fact that Christ bled and died to forgive us of those things. Right. And no matter how much we struggle with those things, um, we know for sure that Christ has redeemed us. Yes. That's what we can believe in. And when we look at the example of Jonathan doing this great thing, it's really kind of hard to apply that in, in, a, in a normal everyday sort of situation. But it, it does imply the way he's teaching this, yeah. it's implying that if you're living an ordinary Christian life, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, something's wrong with you. you got to step out and do something that's absolutely impossible. Right. Because that's how For you... For God to show up. Well, that's how you show faith in God. Right. If you just say, God, I, I am totally awe struck by what you've done for me on the cross. and that That's you, not enough. That, that I, I'm, I'm totally forgiven of my sins right. because of what you've done. And you've given me your word and you've planted me in the Christian church so that I can be reminded of what Christ has done for me. And I can worship you in that church and I can grow and learn from your word in that church. And when I die, I get to go to heaven. None of those things are good enough belief. You have to go, me and my buddy, we just quit our jobs and we got a car that's about to die. And we're going to drive to Venezuela because we feel like God told us to do this impossible thing. We don't have any money. And my friend... Um, 
needs medicine and we don't have enough to even get halfway there. Yes! We're doing what Francis Chan told us to do. Yeah. People do things like that. Right. And they get into serious trouble. Sometimes they die. Sometimes right. they don't take their medicine because they've been told right. to have this crazy faith. Right. So he's not making any of that clear. That and is correct. I, and I'm not saying that Francis Chan personally wants those sorts of things to happen. But by him not being clear, he's leaving that door wide open. Yeah, he is. See, this is what we're hoping will happen with some of you. That you'll look at a friend and go, you know, our campus... 4,000 people, let's go. It may be that the Lord's with us. And the Lord could save our entire campus with just the two of us. It may be. It could be that I go back to my, my college, my university, my job. Okay. It could be. So scripture does talk about how, I mean, Jesus says that he came to divide you know there's going to be mother mm -hmm. against daughter or father against son i mean he came and there won't be peace there won't be all these people that will rise up and follow him that there's he, going to be a problem there will be people who say yes and people who say no right and, and there he, will always be people who say no more so than it's a narrow road yes and so for him to say hey we could save our whole campus mm -hmm. for a thousand he's given that could that be Possibly, but if you look at scripture, it's not something that we're told to expect. Right. And he's also going to say that you have to be expectant. Right. If, you, if you're not expectant, then you're guilty of preventing these things from happening. Right. But does God want to save your whole campus? I, I guess you could maybe say theoretically, God loves the world. God wants to save people. John 3, 16 and yeah. 17, of but, course. But it's also true that, like you just said, Jesus expects us as his disciples to encounter people who don't want to be Christians. They don't want right. to be saved. They, they're against God. Which is why we have a narrow gate. He said many... The gate know, is narrow. Yeah. He wide didn't say... Wide is the gate of destruction. The, wide is the right. gate that leads to destruction. To destruction, right. Um, does, does that mean that we should be happy when people reject Christ? Of course of not. Of course not. But realistically, don't go back and think, how come I couldn't save all 4,000 people? Right. God must not be real. Or I did something wrong. Because they're going to be whipped into a frenzy. Right. They're going to be told to dream these gigantic dreams. And they're going to happen. And if they don't, it's your problem. It's your fault. You, right. You dreamed it, but you didn't follow through. Or something He's wrong. already warning them about how they're probably not going to follow through. Right. Which, can, can we all just admit, nobody follows through to the extent that they want to. Nobody right. ever has. Nobody ever will. Francis Chan doesn't. Right. Even though he talks about reading the Bible and praying every single day. I can just about bet that he has days that he forgets or he runs out of time or his schedule doesn't permit it. As holy as he is, and I know he's one of the most holy people in the world, I still think he's not as holy as he could be because that's our sinful nature. Exactly. Always Nobody's poking perfect. its head. Yes. Yeah. You know, last night... Um, I wish I could make this go faster. I know. Is last he already night, fast? Christy talked about... It wouldn't work. Oh, that's right. How she was healed, which was amazing, right? But then she talked about Moses in the burning bush. I gotta ask you something. Have you ever been jealous of Here you Moses? Go. Moses. Yeah? Okay. No. Okay. A little bit, a little bit. I, I never really was. Um, but then this year, when I was reading through Exodus, I was thinking, man, how amazing would it be to be Moses? I mean, don't you just once in your life, when she was talking last night about the burning bush, I was just thinking, what if tomorrow on my way to the sand, I see a bush that is on fire? Okay, and then the voice of God comes out of the bush, speaking directly to me. You won't see me at the sand if that happens, right? No, have you ever tried to imagine, oh God, oh my gosh, Lord, could I just have something like that? I mean, seriously, during worship, I'm thinking, God, <coughs> can I hear your voice? Can I see you? You appeared to Moses like, I want something like that. Okay, uh, if you want to hear God's voice, we have his word. Now, I appreciate that he actually is using God's word a little bit more than most of these people do. 
it'd be better if he would read it more and talk less and give emotional stories less. But still, right. he's using the Bible more than most of these people do. But this idea that you, I want to hear God. It's all about you. What you want. God, come on. My head is empty right now. Start talking to me. He's given you his word. Right. And you know, it becomes very self-fulfilling or self-focused. And you want to be fulfilled. You want to be filled. You're really saying, uh, God, this isn't enough. Right. I want more. I want more. And that gets you into trouble. Gear it. Give me a personal word. Gear it directly to me. Don't talk to everybody. Just talk just to me. Yeah. When I was reading through Exodus this year, the whole time I'm thinking, whoa, he got to do that. You know, we, we know about the plagues, right? But try to imagine being Moses when God is speaking to one person on the earth and said, Moses, go tell Pharaoh this is going to happen tomorrow. And you're the one that's communicating with him. <coughs> that whole time. And then you're, you're against the Red Sea. And God says, Mo it's okay, Moses. Just do this. And you watch, you know, all the Egyptians drown in the sea. And then everyone starts complaining. And God says, don't worry. Tell them tomorrow there'll be bread on the ground. And you're looking at the crowd going, you guys, calm down. When you wake up tomorrow, there's going to be bread on the ground in the desert. And I'm like, oh. That'd be so awesome to be that guy. Okay, but here's maybe my favorite part. Okay, listen to this. In Exodus chapter 19, in verse 9, he says to Moses, he goes, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may believe you forever. Okay, so then he tells Moses, okay, tomorrow when I show up, I'm going to come in a cloud, like with power. I'm going to speak to you in a cloud because I want everyone seeing me talk to you. So this way they listen to you. And I remember reading that, I'm going, God, I want that. Because nowadays you preach and there's like a thousand opinions telling you you're wrong. That's a little different than Moses being specifically spoken to by God. So he's equating with his ministry and his preaching as hearing from God. But now all these people are attacking him opposed to, you know, if there was just a cloud that was over him like Moses, mm -hmm. people wouldn't be attacking him. Because God's speaking to him. Why can't it be like today? Why can't, why can't we have that today? What, what he's doing here is he's, he's, he's going to go on for about 10, 11 minutes yeah. about how great it was to be Moses and don't you wish you were Moses and wouldn't that be incredible? And then he's going to say, why do you want to be like Moses? You shouldn't want to be like Moses. To browbeat you. We, got, we got something better than Moses. Right. And he's going to twist the Bible Big time. Pretty big time uh, after that. So anyway. let's keep Same going. Same thing was happening in Moses' day. And God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show up in a cloud and I'm just going to talk to you. Then everyone knows, okay, we'll follow him. We'll follow him because God has a special... I mean, isn't that what you want? For God to just show himself in front of everyone so you can say, see, I told you my God is real. So if you want your friends to become Christians and to believe that God is real, mm -hmm. you have to have a relationship with God similar to what Moses had because mm -hmm. it'll just be so obvious that you'll be like mm -hmm. Moses. I think that's what he's trying to get at here. Okay. And then he's going to go right after this and say, you really shouldn't want that because you have something even better than that. How dare you think that? <clears throat> yeah, even though he just is, right now he's encouraging them to think that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the story goes on. Listen to this. <laughs> Verse 16 says, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. 
Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln. And the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. Okay. I don't think there's any mountains in... He just stopped right there, but he almost stopped in mid-thought. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, this is Exodus 19.23, Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy <clears throat> the lord replied go down and bring aaron up with you but the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the lord or he will break out against them so moses went down to the people and told them in the next chapter chapter 20 is the next verse and god spoke all these words i am the lord your god who brought you out of egypt out of the land of slavery you shall have no other gods before me and this is the beginning of him describing what we now call the Ten Commandments. So he's reading into this passage the idea that you can have this incredible, amazing encounter with God where you experience him, him in such a way that you then go out and everybody's like, wow, I believe in God now because of the experience that you had. Right. Um, he hasn't gotten to the glory yet. Yeah, this, that's not really that's, what this is about. Right. That the glory of God is actually a very frightening thing. And he hasn't and, gotten there yet. And the holiness of God is such that the people would die if right. they were even close to God because of their unholiness. She wants to come up now. Here, honey. Okay. Okay. Do you want to go, wanna go in the little bed? <laughs> what do you think? Missouri, you're right. But, okay, let's pretend, okay, that there's a mountain out there. And I go, hey, you guys. We're going to leave this tent right now. We're going to go for like a mile hike. And then we're going to go to a base of the mountain. And God's going to answer us from there. Would you walk with me? Okay. We'd all go, right? Like, okay, what is going to happen? But they get there. And this, this, this mountain, they say that it's, it's on fire. And it's wrapped in smoke. Because the Lord descended on, in, in, on fire. And, and now they're hearing the lightning, the thunder. Now, you imagine you're at the base of the mountain and you see it on fire. Okay? Imagine this. Now there's an earthquake and the whole mountain is shaking while it's on fire. There's lightning. There's thunder. Moses speaks to God. God answers him in thunder. And you're watching this. And then God says, Moses, come up here. And you watch a human being walk up a mountain that is shaking and on fire and filled with smoke. And there's lightning and there's thunder and the presence of God. And Moses is warning, don't touch this mountain. You will die as he's walking right into the fire. Could you imagine if that was you? Everyone's watching. Man, I've imagined this. I'm imagining it right now. You're all watching. And now suddenly Francis is not just a speaker. He's, he's walking into a fire. I find this really peculiar. <laughs> he's imagining himself being Moses. And I'm, I talked about this in that video I made a month and a half ago. Mm -hmm. That he is portrayed as the Moses figure in that video. He's right. literally walking up a mountain at the very end. They have the camera zoom in on his face, talking about seeing the face of God. And I, I, I didn't obviously see this because this just came out right. afterwards, uh, uh, two or three weeks ago. Why would you... Tell an entire crowd that you're now imagining yourself as Moses. And wouldn't, wouldn't that be incredible if that was you going up the mountain and everybody's watching you? He's really kind of getting off on imagining himself as Moses with the whole crowd watching him. 
I could be reading into it, but that seems like a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Or at least somebody who's got an issue with wanting to be adored by a large group of people. Yeah. And God is speaking to him. I'm thinking, man, how do you not get jealous of that? And then it goes on and on, and it talks about how later on Moses has this tent of meeting. Remember that? Where every time he, he's walking to his tent, everyone gets out of their tents and goes, Oh no, there goes Moses. He's going into his tent. And they know what happens. Every time they, that he goes in his tent, you see this cloud come down. And the glory of God come down. And everyone would just stare at him. And then he'd come out of the tent and his face would be glowing to where people are terrified. And I'm going, oh man, Lord, this is unreal. And then we get to that great, great <clears throat> passage in Exodus 33. This is so important for us today. Because this is when God says to Moses, hey, these people, I'm tired of them. They're complaining about everything. I'm not going to go with you. I'll send an angel with you. But you guys can all go to the promised land. And do you guys remember what Moses said? What he said? That's right. If your presence doesn't go with us, I'm not going. Well, he took a verse in the beginning of the of chapter 33. He skipped the part where God says, "My presence will go with you." It's after God says, my presence will go with you, that Moses says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. So he's confirming how important it is for the presence, but he's not responding to God saying, I won't go with you. He's responding to God agreeing to go with them. Yeah, and then explaining why it's so important that he does go with him. Um, So this comes after... I don't know why, but he's really skipping a lot of stuff here. Maybe he's just trying to get it to say what he wants it to say. That it's all about the presence thing, where you are in God's presence and God might show up, like he's going to maybe show up at the send in the stadium. She's chewing on it, isn't she? (laughs) Okay, so I'm going to read 33. Um, Aaron makes the huge mistake of making the golden calf. Okay. And they have their, their bracelets or right. their necklaces. Everything's melted ornaments. into a, right, into a golden and calf. And the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. Starting verse 30, I mean chapter 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised and promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Wow. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites you are a stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you for even a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Uh, 13.7 Now Moses used to make a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away calling it the tent of meeting. <clears throat> Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp and whenever Moses went out to the tent all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each of each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. So Moses is kind of saying to God, Mm -hmm. I kind of need some clarity here. 
Verse 14, the Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. So what does Moses said, say? Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? So he's kind of confirming, yeah, if you weren't going to do what you just said you're going to do, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be worth it because mm -hmm. then how would anybody know that we really are the true people of God, the Israelite people with all these promises from the true God? So he's not saying, God, I want you to go with because I need your presence. It's so important. And I'm not going to go if you don't go. If you don't go, I'm not going to go. He, so I'm God, done. God, God just said I am going to go. Right. So and, he mis misrepresented scripture. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. This is what Francis Chan keeps saying over and over again. Yeah, show, glory. Come on, I want to see more. Right. It hurts my throat to do that, thankfully. Well, stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And that's capital L-O-R-D, which in Hebrew is something that nobody knows exactly what it means because there's vowels missing. Yeah. And some people don't want to pronounce it because they feel that that would be blasphemous to even say the word. Uh, anyway, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So, this is a really mysterious thing. What does it actually mean to see the face of God? There's, you know, right before this, he says that Moses talks to him face to face, which obviously is a different meaning than what he says just a right. little bit later when he says, you can't see my face. Uh, whatever the case, it doesn't make sense for us to say, God, we want to see your face. It just doesn't make sense to see that. It doesn't make sense to say that because right here, God says, you can't see my face and live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have, um, keep going, because I have this about glory in John. John 1, 14 through 18. Yeah, you want to read that now? Does that apply? Um, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's right. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in parentheses, John bore witness about him and cried out, This um, was he of whom I said. He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. This is John the Baptist. A, end quote, yes, for parenthesis. Um, and from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is the Father's, um, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. <clears throat> that was first John? Um, nope. I meant John, John 1. John 1, 14 through 18. And this is going to expound more on what he is going to be talking about with glory. Mm -hmm. And then also the glory um, in Corinthians that he talks about, that he doesn't yeah. read the whole thing. So what he's going to do over and over again is he's, he's going to, whenever the word glory appears, yeah. he's going to say, without really saying it, that applies to what could happen at this all-day event where you're going to sit there and listen to music right. for, and listen to people yell at you for 12 hours. Right. Then the glory might show up. Right. It has nothing to do with Jesus right. and the glory that Jesus portrayed, as you just read. He's going to compare the glory of the Old Testament and how much we want that. But mm -hmm. he hasn't even gotten there yet about, yeah. right. That's so important. He goes, if your president doesn't go, he goes, why do I care to go to a land filled with milk and honey? He goes, I don't care. I'm, I'm lactose intolerant. I don't, I don't even care. He didn't say you that. Know? Like, yeah, he's being a why jokester. do I care to go he's to being this a jokester. great land? Because you got to remember this is the guy that saw the burning bush. This is the guy that walks up a mountain that's on fire and hangs out with God for 40 days. 
and gets the Ten Commandments. This is the guy that goes into a tent and actually God is in the room. I mean, can you imagine being alone in a tent with God and the glory comes down and now you come out and everyone's screaming. You're like, what, what? Your face is on fire. That's not what happened. It is not what happened. But he's elaborating to make... He's trying to just push this idea over and over again. He's encouraging them to want to be like Moses right. and have these amazing experiences. Yeah. And then he's going to say, why do you want to have those experiences? We haven't gotten there yet. Right. And so when you've experienced this with God, and he says, I'm not going to go with you, you go, I don't want to go then. I experience God. Why do I... I just read the passage and he's just really twisting it. Yes, Hear yes. about a good land, a good house, a good job. I've seen the face of God and I want to stay in his presence. Now there's a false dichotomy he's presenting here that if you want to have a good house and a good job and basically live a normal life, that means you don't want to have the presence of God and be a super holy person like Moses or Francis Chan. Correct. It's all these, you know, choices between two things that aren't even right. related. What I think is interesting is when Jesus, the transfiguration, and Peter's like, hey, let's have a tent. Yeah. And we can just stay here and worship. It's like, no, that's not what this right. is about. Right. That's a really good point. Because the transfiguration is something he doesn't bring up. No. But he probably should. But the yes. reason he isn't is because Jesus said, no, you shouldn't want to stay, stay on the here. mountain. Yes. You need to go reach people. Yes. You need to go and... You know, be a witness for me. And it's also weird because the Holy Spirit points us to Christ. That's what his job is. Right. He's not going to bring that up ever. Ever. You or guys, the gospel. Is that you? Seriously, you guys, this is, you guys think about this. You guys, you guys, you guys. What are you after <laughs> tomorrow? Because I, some of you will be happy no matter what. Now he's going to scold them. Yes, because you're happy. Seriously. Seriously. I don't mean that as a put down or yes, whatever. Yes, you do. Yes, he does. It's just, it's just facts. It's facts. You're some happy. Some of you happy people. You have a problem. And Why are they happy, honey? Why because is they he... have the joy of the Lord. No, me. <laughs> because they like going to conferences because these are all superstars. He's one of them. Right. He knows that a vast number of these people, a large percentage of these people, they go to these events to see their rock star Christian celebrities. Or, Francis Chan being at the very top of that And the pyramid. music celebrities. Oh, the music celebrities are the most important. Right. In fact, if you go to the Send from yes. 2018, I believe, mm. uh, they have divided up different segments of that day-long event. Mm -hmm. They have the speaking as one, you know, here's segment. here's so-and-so speaking. Yeah. Now here's... Uh, whatever the group the, the, singing, the, the group singing. Yeah. you know, there's you know, 300,000 people watch that video, yeah, and then the guy's talking about adoption, 2,000 people. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's exaggerated. Okay, I got that just a little bit wrong. The send just put up videos with part one, part two, part three, and they just gave it a title that had something to do with what was in that segment. It was other people who took those videos and gave them the titles specifically with the name of the singer or the singers. And those are the ones that got uh, many hundreds of thousands, and in some cases, millions of views. This woman, Priscilla Alcantara, is a huge, huge singer, uh, I believe in Brazil. You can see a repost of her singing at The Send in 2019 was reposted by a guy who I believe is also Brazilian, and it has almost a million views. But she herself is a big superstar. Let me show you some of her videos on her own channel. This show is a singing competition where the contestants have to wear a mask and they sing a number of times before they finally get to the end where they take off their mask. And this girl won the competition just in this uh, most recent year. Woo! 
como é bom olhar para vocês. Now here's Priscilla singing at the Send in Orlando in 2019, and she is super good. But this is a concert. This is not a move of the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to play a little bit of this. But, but it's kind of making a point. Yeah, people are in, in uh, I don't have this, uh, maybe I have it in a hard drive somewhere, but right before the pandemic, yeah, within a couple of years of the, the period before the pandemic, uh, Mike Bickle and a few other of these people said, we are no longer going to be featuring famous speakers at these events because we realize that people- No headliners? Are, no headliners. We're just going to say, this is an event where you're going to come to try to, you know, be a better Christian and experience God or whatever but we're not going to promote these speakers because we realize that people are coming specifically to see their Christian celebrity people. Speaker, right? And we don't want to promote that anymore. I found a blog here from Mike Bickle from October of 2018. And this is exactly what I was talking about. He's saying basically um, here in the second paragraph, charismatic conferences have been wonderful and useful for many years, but now risk missing the point entirely if they are not deeply attuned to the whispering voice of the Holy Spirit. The uh, idea here is they've just been focusing on the wrong things, that the world is too troubled, there's too many difficulties in the world. One facet of our corporate reset is that we will not highlight the roster of speakers and worship teams this year. So this was him talking about the upcoming One Thing Festival. And he's saying that they need to focus more on God and they... Uh, you know, basically are apologizing. And he says here, it's nobody's fault. We just realize we're not focusing enough on God. So that's what he said in the, uh, the year 2018. Then the pandemic came when they finally were able to have conferences again. It looks like they said, let's get those celebrities back, at least from the looks of it. Wah, wah. What? <laughs> oh, well, they stopped doing that. Wah, wah. Now they are back to doing it very quickly thereafter, because I think they tried it a few times and they probably saw the numbers going down. Yeah. So they're back to promoting the Christian Here celebrities. What works? As long as Todd White preaches, yep. Christine Kane preaches, Lindy leads some worship. Yeah, Francis. Okay, all right. It, as long as uh, yeah, I'm one of the celebrities. Know, black voice is back up there, and then oh, and then what if Carrie Job ends with that children and their children and their children song? Oh, we're just it's gonna be the best. And you'll leave and you'll go, oh, that was so good. We sing about children forever. And uh, and you'll, you know, put it on your Instagram, everything else. It was great. But here's what I'm saying, you guys. We're I've been beating. to a lot of good conferences. Yeah, that's how you make your living, pal. That's right. A lot of good conferences. That's what I've he does a for a living. A lot of good conferences. Okay. That's, life. And that's what some of us are feeling. Yeah. We're going, God, I don't want another good conference. Well, then stop doing it. Just quit going to conferences. Stop doing it. That's right. You win bag. Yeah. Oh, I'm. I'm this sorry. It's been really painful. I want to call him a crybaby windbag. Can I do that? <laughs> Can I just do that, please? You can. This is your house, and you can say whatever you want. I know it gets people upset, but I just... It's hard. It, why would you do this? Right. Why would you browbeat people for going to the conference where you're the headliner, and the people are there to see you, and you're scolding them for going to a thing to, to see, see you? you? Right. I don't want to go to conferences anymore where people... Well, stop. No, right. Who, who forced you to go here? Your organization is one of the co-sponsors. Right. I think we could be done here, but we're not. This is going to go on much longer. <sighs> we're sorry. But what's important to know is to see how this is so disjointed. Yes. He's got 40 minutes of all of these things, mm -hmm. and he's stringing it together, and he talks really fast, and he's all over the place. And it's and all we, held together with emotion. Right. And, and crying. And this is like the Pseudo fourth crying. or the fifth time we've watched this now, and we're seeing It gets how, worse. Right? Because we're understanding how bad it is mm -hmm. and how disjointed. Seriously. What do you think? God, if you don't show up tomorrow. God, if you don't show up tomorrow. 
What does that mean? Yes. How would you know that he did for sure? How would you know that? What, what is the measuring stick? There so, is none. I'm just telling you, I'm asking the question, but I know the answer. Right. The, the answer is we don't know. But he's always there. He, he's right, with us right. to the end of the age. Right. So this is stupid. <laughs> what he is saying is stupid. It is it stupid? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Except that if I don't feel it, right. or I better be there. Right. But if I'm there and I don't feel it, well, he didn't show up for me. The he showed up for you, mm -hmm. but he didn't show up for me. The, the, the real measuring stick, which is not a good measuring stick at all, uh, is did you feel right. like he showed up? Right. Did you feel it? Even though he's saying this is not about emotion, it he's is. He's all about emotion. It is about emotion. Who says he's going to show me your glory? Show us your glory like Moses. Show me your glory. Where Moses, who's already seen the burning bush, and he's been on a mountaintop that's on fire for 40 days, and he's been in a tent of meeting, he's telling God, can I see more? Where? He goes, and I'm not going to go anywhere unless you go that. with me. You guys, we can't be okay Here we with go. another good conference. But see me We're at the next one next God. month. Actually, it's September 25th and 26th. <laughs> and I'll be in Indiana. They're at the conference clapping. Yes. It, eventually, he gets them to stop clapping by browbeating them so yeah. much that and by the end of this... make them confess sins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it may not be at the stadium. It may be in your bedroom before you get to the stadium. And then stay and in your bedroom. Not, that's an applause line. Yeah. If they can see God in this incredible way, just like Moses in their bedroom... Then just teach them how to do that so you don't have to have these expensive stadium events anymore where yeah. people have a risk of heat stroke because it was like 90 degrees at the stadium. And worship a person instead of God. It's pretty much what's happening. Yes. No one admits to it. Nobody but does. Pull away, t unplug the electric cords from this thing and the whole thing falls apart. Right. It's, it's people yelling and it's music that's all emotionally manipulative. Right. It could be tonight that you're so hungry for him that he reveals himself in such a way where it just blows your mind and you don't want to leave your room. The claw. And I would encourage Who's in charge here? The claw. The claw is our master. The claw chooses who will go <laughs> and who will stay. <laughs> Toy Story. The claw. His hand gestures. I'm it's, sorry. It's amazing we got this far without mentioning his <laughs> ridiculous hand gestures. I know. Francis, could you just say something without you just, being so? And you just want God. God. Could you go, 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 But this okay. isn't about hype or emotionalism. Uh, no, no. God forbid. I mean, if, if, if you're going to your room... I mean, clawing at the door. Number one, I'm, I'm guessing that the vast majority of these people are sharing rooms. Right. Do you really think they're all sitting in the room having this intimate experience Kumbaya. with God that's better than anything that's happening in the entire history of their lives? Better than the, Moses? Be, well, better than the Send, where there's a huge crowd around them. But, but for him to even say, you want the experience like Moses, go to your bedroom. Okay, mm. Moses... Was he all same? Well, you think Moses was a one off? He was, yeah, he was. I mean, so it's a unique experience. He was, and I don't want to be Moses. He was created for a specific time and place in scripture and in history. And he takes it out of context and says, Don't you want to be that? But then he, we haven't gotten to the other. Yeah. I urge you not to. Here we go. But do you believe this? Because too many... Here's, here's the thing I really want to ask. Do uh -huh. you believe this is possible? Here we, no, no, no. Keep going. This is the Great Pumpkin. Oh. <laughs> Do you believe in the Great Pumpkin with complete sincerity, without any doubt at all? Because the Great Pumpkin will arrive. Yeah. Arise or, or arrive. He can he, do either. What, is he, what was he supposed to do? He's supposed to rise, he, from, rise the from the patch, pumpkin yeah. patch. If you have complete belief. Each year the Great Pumpkin rises out of the pumpkin patch that he thinks is the most sincere. He's got to pick this one. He's got to. I don't see how a pumpkin patch can be more sincere than this one. You can look all around and there's not a sign of hypocrisy. It's the great pumpkin. He's rising up out of the pumpkin patch. What did he leave us? Did he leave us any 
toys? I was robbed. I spent the whole night waiting for the great pumpkin. And as, as soon as and Linus did show a yeah. little bit of doubt in one of his, and he goes, if. oh no. Or, I, I said if he shows up. Yeah. Now he, he's never going to show up, never, but look it, what's going to happen It's all to my me. fault. It won't be long now. If the great pumpkin comes, I'll still put in a good word for you. Good grief. I said if. I meant when he comes. I'm doomed. All right. Because I think there are too many people go. who would be content just experience a fraction of what Moses experienced. Hang on. And we kind of look at Moses like, well, he was a one-off, and he's going to get this special treatment. Yes. But here's what killed me, amazed me, <sighs> excited me, as I was reading through the book of Exodus year. Second Corinthians. Second I turned to Second Corinthians 3. 3. Okay. You guys, yeah. look what it says in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. Verse 7. It's talking about Moses. Wow. And it says this, Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was brought to an end... Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Okay, so why are they cheering? Because they've already been told that glory equates to having this incredibly emotional experience at an event or in your bedroom or Closer something. Closer to God and you're holier. Yeah, you're going to... You're going to experience the best glory ever. And if the ministry of death, which was the Old Testament, brought glory, how much more in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. you're gonna, we're going to have so much more glory. We are going to have glory? Can you please read the scripture in context, well, Mr. Kozar? <laughs> I'll read chapter 3, starting at the beginning. Okay. Are we, are we, this is now, uh, if you remember, 1 Corinthians is when Paul has to really correct them on a, a ton of really bad errors. Yeah. And uh, 2 Corinthians comes later. And this first part, uh, I won't go into detail because it actually applies to something that Todd White and other people say often. And they get it totally wrong. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Verse 4, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. By the way, some people use that verse to say the Bible is the letter and it kills, and the Spirit and is the thing that gives life. But if you focus on the Bible too much, it'll, it'll kill you. Wow. It's really bad. It is bad. The Spirit actually speaks to us through the Word. Right. That's almost blasphemous. It is, yes, very right. much. Uh, but the, the letter is referring to the law. The law points out our sin. Yeah. That's what it and means. And why it says, we're condemned, yes, because of the sin. Because we cannot keep the law. Right. Now, verse 7 is where he started. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone, in other words, the Ten Commandments, the law from the Old Testament, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? So, does this and sound like it's... there. Yeah, for if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will, much more will what is permanent have glory. Now, you know what? I read this in the New Living Translation. And it, was, it actually did a really good job of making it easier to kind of follow Paul's thought. Can I finish in this one and then sure. you can do the... Okay. Sure. Uh, verse 12. Since we have such a hope... Actually, did you... S yeah, permanent glory. Since we have this new covenant? Since we have such a... No. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened for to this day when they read the Old Covenant that 
um, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ it is taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Mm -hmm. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from um, from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Okay, it's the end. And that was the ESV, right? Yes. I think that's what Francis Chan was using, too. Okay. I don't use a New, New Living Translation very much, but sometimes it's such easy to understand yeah. English that it's a little <clears throat> bit... Because Paul is kind of making a point over and over again, just re kind of repeating it with slightly different words. But but in, in and it doesn't lose its um, power. You just understand it better. Yeah, it's a good translation as far as easy to understand translations go. It's, it's not it's not being, perfect, but right. it's it's not like uh, anything like the message or right. it's not Passion. a it's not a paraphrase. No, it has paraphrasy tendencies a bit. Anyway, that's why it's good to have several. That's it's good to have several. Uh, since this new covenant gives us such confidence, hey, we hang, can. Hang. Do you want to start from three again? Let me start at seven. Okay. That's where he started. All right. Um, no, I'll start at four. Okay. We are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we can do anything of lasting value by ourselves. Our only power and success comes from God. He is the one who has enabled us to represent this new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old way ends in death, and the new way the Holy Spirit gives life. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Does he just give us experiences where we feel something? No, the Holy Spirit constantly directs us to salvation in Christ. It points us to Christ. So if you think the Holy Spirit only relates to having these kind of hyper-charismatic mm -hmm. experiences, you have a very narrow and incorrect view of what the Holy Spirit is actually doing. Mm -hmm. That old system of law etched in stone led to death, yet it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory when the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old covenant, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new covenant, which makes us right with God? There you go. It's about us being made right with God right. through what Christ has done for us. This idea of glory is totally related to what Jesus did for us, right. not us having an emotional experience where we are like Moses and we feel something and our face lights up and everyone's so impressed with our holiness. And we should want holiness. that in our life. In fact, the, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new covenant. The glory of the new covenant, which yeah. is, again, it's about Christ and what he did for us. Right. So if the old covenant, which has been set aside, was full of glory, then the new covenant, which remains forever, has far greater glory. Since this new covenant gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Why can we be bold? Because of the new covenant, not because we're going to have all this glory in and of ourselves. And, and he never mentions the new covenant. And he never mentions the gospel in his right. preaching, we which are not is kind of important. Yeah. <laughs> We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the people of Israel would not see the glory fading away. But the people's minds were hardened, and he's, Paul's talking about the Jewish people who have refused to believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. The people's minds were hardened, and even to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, a veil covers their minds so that they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, in other words, when the, the Jews who were unbelieving in Christ were reading the Old Testament, Torah. they mm -hmm. refused to see Christ in there, even though Christ said, the whole thing is about me. Right. Their hearts are covered with that veil, and they do not understand. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, then the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, He gives freedom. And all of us have had that veil removed so that we can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. I like it's that. It's not our glory. We reflect the glory of God, not because not we are holy, but because we talk about the holiness and we talk about the gospel of the holiness of Christ. Who lives within us. Yes. Mm -hmm. And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him and reflect His glory even more. So anything that we do that's good is just a reflection of the good that's in Christ. Right. Excellent. I, Very well put. Yeah. This is the word of God. Which he didn't read all of. He goes, this is the Old Testament. Here we go. 
Too many of us are living like the Old Testament is unreachable. And he's saying, no, that was just a shadow of things to come. That was the ministry of death. And think about how much glory came through that. And he goes, if that was the ministry of death, he goes, will not the ministry of the Spirit have much more glory? So he doesn't define it. No. And he's leading them to believe that... That the Spirit gives the glory. glory. And what does that mean? Well, you, you're going to have this experience, thing. this thing. No. What the glory was, was Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's who the glory yep. is. And what we can do, us. we can reflect that glory in the sense that we <sighs> proclaim the gospel. Right. And we, and we serve people and we love people and we do good deeds. Yes, but it's really not about us having this incredible experience it's and going with, into your room and right. being like Moses. Or, or better. Or better. Because it's the New Testament, so we're going to be more glorified. It's like, it's not about us and glory. Mm -hmm. Who was the one glorified was Jesus Christ. That... That is it. Hello. And, when you and think if you have of... a problem with that, we're done here. <laughs> so, I like the idea of you're just holding a mirror. And instead of pointing to yourself, yes. the mirror has got the, 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 the thing that Jesus did. And it's described in the Word of God already. Yes. The Word of God has the whole thing. It, yes. It tells us what we need to know. Right. It's the Word of God. Yeah. It's not a word about God. In fact, Jesus is it. called the Word. Yes. In in first John was the Word, yes. and the Word was with so God. So we just hold up a mirror God. and we hide behind that mirror and we point people to the Word of God. So that's what we should see ourselves as being. Not hey, you know, I climbed the mountain like Moses. Only I'm actually better see than Moses. See my face. I'm I'm full I'm of glory. Glowing. Yeah. Because I know more. You guys, we need to be expectant people. We can't look at these Old Testament stories like they're beyond us. We, in a way, have to look at them like they're beneath us. That's our foundation. And now, I mean, this is the New Testament. He says in verse 9, For there was glory in the ministry of condemnation. The ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. <clears throat> For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. We have to be people who stop looking at the Old Testament and go, ooh, I wish I could have seen that. But that's what you just spent <laughs> ten minutes doing. Yeah, we timed it ten minutes. It was actually over. On. It was over ten minutes. It went I think. on and on and on about how great it was, and don't you don't, wish? Don't you wish? And I wish I was. Yeah. yeah I wish I, mean, I was. Yeah, just. I I'm envious. I wish I was the guy with everybody yeah. watching me. Going up the hill, coming back down <laughs> I with mean, a glowing face. Psychologically, maybe he was just trying to get people to think a certain way, but he himself really, to me, sounded like he was saying, "I like it when people yeah. watch me." Uh huh. Yeah. Well. That was the um, commercial. Mm -hmm. Commercial of him walking up, the, which Steve reminded me of. And with one united voice, we want to come before God Almighty and ask Him, God, can we see your glory? I wish I could have been Moses because the New Testament teaches there's more glory available to us. There's you more know? glory available to us. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does that mean, Francis Chan? Mm -hmm. What are you saying? And we watch this and he never does go any further than no. just repeating that. No, lay down. And he keeps repeating it as if he's telling know. them what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And he's not clarifying it at all. No. Nope. He's leading them to think that that glory is not what the biblical version here is. It's right. this glory that is just like the send. Or the experience you'll get from the send. Guys, we have got to stop belittling the Holy Spirit. This is the most amazing part of the whole thing. Who's doing that? We have got to stop belittle, belittling the Holy Spirit. He's talking from the very heart of the New Apostolic Reformation, hyper-charismatic, word of faith sort of world. He's in that camp right this very minute. And he's saying they got to stop belittling the Holy Spirit. I, I'm I, When I first heard that, I'm like, really? Do you know where you are right now, Francis Chan? I don't know why he would say that. I mean, he's stringing all these things together that... This is the place that talks about the Holy Spirit more than anybody. Right. I mean, in general. Right. 
It's a whole category of people in the charismatic movement, right. especially this New Apostolic Reformation mm -hmm. hyper charismatic movement. Right. Dr. Michael Brown doesn't like it when we use the word New Apostolic Reformation, even, even though, though C. Peter Wagner used the word, invented it to describe the hyper charismatic movement. Was it Cambridge who also put together Oxford? Oxford. Yeah. Explain that again. Uh, the two sociologists in the book um, Network Christianity. They describe things exactly the way I do and the way Justin Peters does and the way Chris Rosberg does. And where are they from does. again? They're from Oxford. <laughs> Oxford what? Uh, Oxford University Press. Oh. They have pretty high standards for publishing books. And, um, and being and being accurate? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there I, you go. These people don't want to, they want to pretend like there isn't any research <laughs> being done by anybody. And when that research is done, it doesn't matter because... They believe it isn't. It, yeah. <laughs> We have to stop going, oh, that was amazing in Moses' day, but all we get is this spirit. Because the Bible says this must far exceed it. What in must? Glory. The send? Hey guys. Guys. This is all I want anymore. You know, I'm sorry. He keeps elevating himself. This is all I want anymore. This is, if God's not going, I don't want. Well, then stop this going to conferences and giving speeches. I want more than just conferences. Just go to your... I want, I don't, I don't want, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, again, this is like the fourth or fifth time we're seeing this, and all I see is him elevating himself to look humble, because that's what I want. Can I, I... I I'm sorry, I, I, I'm really having a problem with him. I, the more I've watched him, the more I've had that same frustration. Yeah. And I do want to consider... Another way of looking at it that might be more generous to him. And I, I have a video that I really want to finish in the months ahead, but I don't have time because it's going to be really detailed. But it involves Lou Engel at an IHOP event telling the crowd of college students that he has a struggle with pornography. And how he just wants to get it out there. And he wants to repent publicly and tell all these college students, this 60-something-year-old man is telling this, these college students about his struggle with pornography. Yeah. And the thing that I want to point out is his solution is we got to have more of the Holy Spirit. We got to really try harder. We got to blah, 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 blah. He's basically saying we got to do more of the things that we've all been doing and he himself has been doing for decades. So I think Francis Chan keeps going further and further down the same road. He's, he's like digging a hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And he, as the further he gets, he's like, I got to dig this hole deeper because I want to get out. What he needs to do is completely change his theological outlook. Because he thinks the whole purpose of the Christian life is to accomplish these incredible things that we can't accomplish. So he's frustrated, and when he says, I just want this, these things to happen, it's because the, the, the theological foundation is this bizarre holiness foundation that's been going on for like roughly 150 years. <clears throat> going back to the late 1800s, the Pentecostal movement came out of that. It keeps splintering into different movements, and they're all starting with the assumption that the church hasn't done enough, church isn't good enough, people have to do more, God wants more out of us, and he's, I think, possibly... Yes, I think he definitely likes attention, and I definitely think he has a problem with wanting, wanting to go on stage and be even more humble than the last time he showed how humble he was. I do think he has a psychological issue, but I also think theologically he's noticing that these people are never really getting as holy as we want them to be. And instead of saying, maybe the problem is that's because we're always going to retain... The ingredients in the soup that we're using. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the soup keeps the, tasting the same. Yeah. Well, maybe you got to change it up. Maybe yeah. you've got to look to see, okay, what am I doing wrong to it? Maybe we're expecting something to happen that we shouldn't be expecting to right. happen. Maybe the ordinary Christian life is, is, is the ordinary Christian life. And that's the success that God wants us to have because we are living out our Christian life. Maybe the problem is you keep saying we want more, we want more, we want more, and you don't get more. But because then you God say, gave us everything. Yes, yes. God gave us it all right here. Right. And instead of focusing on what Jesus has already done, he continues to focus on what we have not yet done right. because we think we need to do all these things. And then you don't do them. And now you're frustrated with yourself and everybody else. And you're saying you want these things to happen which haven't yet happened. What's well, right. your problem, Francis Chan? You're the one that says these things should happen. And you're being, I think he's being honest in saying that these things aren't happening. But he goes to the next conference and he preaches at the yeah. next conference. And he keeps doing the same thing. So what they say, uh, the... 
the definition of, of insanity, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. I, yeah, I kind of don't like that phrase because it's almost biblical now. Everybody keeps repeating it so much, but I, I think there's some truth to that here. I want us to play right now for faith to grow in our hearts. That's good. For us to come like Jonathan did and say, God. Faith is a gift of God. That's a really good thing to ask for. Now, what if your faith is just simple faith? It says, I know I'm saved. I know that God has done a work in my life and I'm no longer uh, a, a wretched sinner that's under the curse of God. The wrath of God is not my problem anymore because of what Christ has imputed. He's imputed his righteousness to me and it's a free gift. And I can live my life at peace knowing that no matter what, that thing is not going to change. That would be that would be the kind of faith that is a it's a, it's a good type of faith to have. But he's not going to say that. He's going to say you got to have this amazing faith, like Jonathan. Jonathan, you got to do things that are crazy and illogical and impossible, so that God can come in and swoop down and answer our amazing faith. Are you too hot, honey? You're too hot. We stopped the fan and everything in the house from circulating the air. It's well, not that hot down here, but she's all snuggled in right now. I don't know why she's hot. <laughs> anyway. If you wanted to, you could reveal yourself to me tonight. I trust your scriptures. Your spirit could show me things in heaven that Moses never saw. What? I'm believing the word of God. That's the, the opposite. The ministry of the spirit. He just said, I want to get some extra biblical revelation. Right. He did. But, but, but I'm believing the word of God. Which one is it? Right. I guess he might be we saying We hadn't heard both. that one before out of all the times yeah. we've listened to this. That's why we keep stopping it so much. Yeah. There's so much wrong with everything he says. Spirit must far exceed it in glory. I just kept thinking, what if God from heaven looked down tonight? He does look down. And saw this what if? Swarm of people with faith. Now he'll do something. Saying, God, I want this. Well, what? I believe this can happen. What can happen? I believe this is mine to claim. What is no this idea. is your promise? What promise? That don't this know. should far exceed it in glory. What should? I don't and know. And tomorrow it could be, Lord. What could it may be perhaps that you will show up and reveal yourself in a way. He keeps repeating that, but he never describes what it actually no. is. And it really gets under your skin. Well, my skin. It, the the only thing that he has said is yeah. that it, it will mean that you'll actually go out and do stuff. Right. That's the only thing he equated with certainty when, in the beginning when he said, you know, you're, you're, you, are you really going to adopt a child? Are you really going to go on the mission field and go to countries with uh, right. the, where it's really hot and humid and bugs bite you? Things bite you that you don't even know what yeah. they are? Are you going to do that? That's the only thing he said that would prove that God has shown up. Right. So really what he's saying is you better go and do stuff. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't go and do stuff, then we don't have any certainty that God showed up. And we want God to show up, even though the Bible says that we don't need to expect God to show up in this way. There's nothing biblical about this need for God to show up in a new way. In a out, conference. Outside of the church environment where he's promised to be there. Right. In word and sacrament. He's promised to be there. Right. He's ignoring all of that. That exceeds what Moses got to see. Because the ministry of the Spirit must far exceed it in glory. I already did through Jesus Christ. Yes. That was the point. Yep. That was the point. It's not what the glory can exceed through us through the Spirit. It's what Jesus accomplished. Mm. You guys, God knows our hearts. Okay? We don't want to just honor him with our lips and go, God, we believe. No, he sees our hearts. And we need to humble ourselves and say, God... Get rid of the doubt in me. Let me trust your word and not my feelings. Let me trust your <laughs> word and not my previous experience. Your word says the ministry of the Spirit will have even more glory. The ministry of the Spirit is Jesus Christ. Again. In preparation for tomorrow, I just thought, what if there were thousands of us 
that believe 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3, do you have it? That's what we just read. Okay, read yeah. it again. That's the whole thing that he's misinterpreting. Read it again. Just part, you know, this whole thing. I mean, was it 2 Corinthians 3 or 3 verse? No, it's just 3. He's, he's using the whole chapter because, I don't know, it's too hard for him to be specific, I guess. I mean, he has used uh, eisegesis completely. Yeah. This, when you read into the text what you want it to say, yeah. instead of trying to see what the text just says in a natural reading right. in, in context. Because this is about how the glory of Moses is surpassed by the glory of what Jesus did. Now, we reflect that glory in our lives, and when we share the gospel, that's a way of sharing that glory. But it's not a literal glory where we start glowing like Moses right. glowed. Right. We, we're not going to have fire and smoke and stuff because right. that would actually be going back to a lesser form of glory. Right. Um, since this new covenant gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he kind of points to the idea of being bold, mm -hmm. but, but he's saying you got to be bold and ask for the thing that hasn't happened yet. Right. And that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. We can be bold in sharing what has happened. We right. can share the gospel of what Jesus has already done right. and the glory that is shown through what Christ has already done. Right. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying we have to have this new and better glory. Right. And he's not referring to Christ whatsoever. Ever. In this whole thing. Right. And we came with an expectation and go, God, please show us your glory. By the way, this expectation idea is directly related to the idea of being open to the power of suggestion. Hmm. And again, when you are listening to hypnotic music that has a constant beat that goes on for 10 minutes or more, you are induced into a trance-like state where you, you're open to the power of suggestion. And so when he says the expectancy must be there, we have to have this expectancy. Well, what is he telling them to expect? That you're going to have this glory enter you. Right. This supernatural, right. mystical experience. Manifestation. If you have enough expectancy, if right. you're open to it enough, it's going to happen. I really, uh, the, the, the previous send large stadium event that I watched in its entirety, they had the uh, really dangerous false teacher, Rodney Howard Brown, oh, at the conclusion of it, saying, FIRE! And he's the guy that introduced the whole New Apostolic Reformation hyper-charismatic movement. He, he zapped Randy Clark, who then got everyone else zapped. <laughs> Knock stuff over. They literally were doing that, and right. they said that's what showed the Holy Spirit was really there. And and Rodney Howard Brown, this dangerous, false teacher, who also is a prosperity teacher, he's he's still doing it to this day. He's getting people to roll around on the ground and to lose control and to act exactly like people act when they're possessed by demons. Right. And, uh, and we're I, supposed to ignore that. We're supposed to ignore that, and we're supposed to think it's the Holy Spirit, right. because otherwise we're putting God in a box. Right. If people act like they're being possessed by demons... And we say, hey, excuse me, but that's what it looks like when you're possessed by demons. They accuse you of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. How dare you accuse the Holy Spirit of possessing people in a way that's demonic? Hmm. Are we done with this? <sighs> I don't remember. I want to be done. I do too. There's a lot more that we could do, but I think you're, I think you're right. I think we should be done. Yeah, it's bad. And he'll have a link below if you, you know want to watch I'm gonna, the whole thing. I'm going to put the the clip of Rodney Howard Brown doing Good. that. And then you'll hear the audience screaming Good. in terror like it's a haunted house. Now, the microphones aren't directly in in front of the people, so you kind of hear it off in the distance. Yeah. Most of the people are just standing there doing nothing. Right. But you hear this horrifying screaming going on. Yeah. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost come upon every heart. Now in Jesus' name, which tends to happen in a lot of these events when they, they are so ambiguous and they induce this trance-like state 
and they get people to just stand and listen for hours and hours and hours and hours. Wear them down. Wear them down and no tell sleep. them over and over again to be open to whatever God's going to do, what God's going to do. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody's being possessed by demons, right. but I am suggesting that that is happening in some cases. Yeah. I, I, I and have we to need believe to it. be careful. We need to test the spirits. Yeah, I mean, which they never point out because they think you're being a Pharisee if you do that. Right. <laughs> so that's not what Pharisees do. No. Pharisees add to the law. Pharisees are not promoting the Bible. They're promoting extra biblical teaching that isn't in the Bible. Huh. And the Pharisees are not pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. They refuse to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, mm -hmm. who came to take away the sins of the world. They, they wanted to say that Jesus was a false teacher mm -hmm. or that Jesus wasn't the Messiah, that they were the anointed ones and they had all the secret knowledge. There's also a connection to Gnosticism here. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Again, I don't know his motives, but I know at least, at the very least, he's deluded. He's sincerely wrong in a number of different ways, and he doesn't like theology. He, he has admitted over and over again that he's not a good student of theology. He doesn't understand certain things very much. He admits that he pretended to be a, a good theologian. There's a podcast that Brandon Kimber sent me. It's not a, a visual thing. It's just an audio but he talks about going to a conference where he was invited to speak on a topic that he kn knew nothing about, and he asked people to write notes for him. And then he went and spoke on that topic, knowing nothing of the topic, but just using somebody else's notes. Wow. And then when he was sitting around the table with the other speakers, they all realized that this guy doesn't have a clue. And he embarrassed himself. And he didn't want to go back to that environment anymore, which is basically... Uh, connected to John MacArthur and some of the training that this guy, Francis Chan, had initially received through John MacArthur or John MacArthur's seminary. I don't know that we could get these girls to howl. Oh, no. There's no, no interest. No, no interest. Are you going to talk? No, no, no. Hey, you want a treat? You want, to see? you want a treat? What is she doing? I don't know. I've never seen her do that. You want a treat? She's upside down for one thing, so that's not... Yeah, helpful. <laughs> you want a treat? Let's hear it. Let's hear you. Talk to me. What? You want a treat? What are you saying? What? What are you saying? What? Come on, I want to hear you do something. <laughs> I want to hear you do something. I want to hear you do something. Keep going, keep going. So close. They know the camera's on. That's some good barking right there, a little sparky. What do you want? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. What do you want? What do you want? She, she wants the food. That's she all she wants. wants. Yep. All right. Okay, well, we're done. At least we got one of them to say something. Uh, yeah. She's really good. She does it all the time. So I don't know what the deal is. And they're falling off the cushion here. Maybe I'll stick another clip in of her doing it up in the kitchen. Up in the kitchen. When she's not under the pressure of the glaring lights. She's not into showbiz. She's very stiff. <laughs> hey, she's remember? Stiff. Remember, everybody? Uh, we'd love to answer your questions. We can't. We don't have the time. Yeah. And, and you need to find things out for yourself. You need to take responsibility for your own spiritual life. Yeah. We do have a ton of resources yeah. at the Messed Up Church website. A lot of links. Go to the resources page. Look at all the stuff I've put there. Also, look at the recommended channels. Look at the playlist that I've already put together with a lot of other people in their Speaking videos. Speaking of which. Speaking of which. Doring Virtue did an interview with us. That'll and be that up should soon. be coming up soon. Yeah, it was really a good conversation it we had fun. with her about us being a Dogs couple. and discernment. Dogs and discernment. That's what it's called. Yeah. So it, it was really a, a great conversation we had. Well, they'll have to decide that for themselves. They might True. watch it and not like it at all. Well, that happens. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Thanks, you guys, so much for, for all your support. We hope you enjoyed this video. We hope and you found it really super helpful. We appreciate your prayers yep. and all of your love and all of your support. And it has been a rough couple of months. And uh, You can see we don't have Lucy and we don't have her howling at the end. It makes us sad. Yeah. But we're happy to have these two. And before she starts crying, we're going to end the video. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.